for coming. First of all, to all the delegates, and also thank you to all the panel members who have agreed to come and sit on the panels today. And um, this is our first in-person conference since I think 2019. We were just about to run one when COVID kicked in in March 2020. So we've had, as many of you, you know, we've had our own online conferences for the last couple of years, but it's great to be all back together in the same room and to be able to network together and meet each other again. So today's conference is all about uh, creating healthy people, creating healthy environments and creating healthy communities. Um, I think there's no one in this room that's involved in outdoor recreation would be able to deny that one of the biggest things we noticed uh, about COVID was about the surge of people that have started to use the outdoors during that time. And that, whilst the numbers probably still aren't at that peak, there's definitely still well above pre-COVID levels. Um, and, you know, um, Today is then really all basically about looking at how we move forward with regards to outdoor recreation. And even the fact that we have a full room today is testament to uh, outdoor recreation and, and the importance of it in Northern Ireland. I think also again, even last week I think it was, the levelling up fund gave 1.3 million uh, to green spaces. Um, so again, I just think that shows how outdoor recreation is definitely moving up the agenda within government departments across Northern Ireland and also in local authorities and that is to be welcomed. So outdoor recreation, and I, for those who don't uh, know, we're a not-for-profit organisation. We've been on the go since 1999. And essentially at the heart of what we try to do is try to encourage people to get out into the outdoors um, for health and well-being uh, benefits in particular and also to get out and enjoy and appreciate and learn to love the environment in which they're doing their activities. Uh, the last three years, as you haven't probably seen much of us, we haven't been idle, we've been working away in the background trying to shape uh, outdoor recreation and that's everything from policy right through to delivering on the ground. So during the last three years some of the big projects that we've been involved with, last year we published Pomni which is People in the Outdoors Monitor for Northern Ireland. So that, that's the first time ever in Northern Ireland we've had a population-wide research project on outdoor recreation and that information is now being able to fed into things like programme for government. So, so that's great to have that information and that evidence base now. <coughs> Another major project we've been involved in is green space mapping. Um, so um, that is essentially going to become the authoritative map for all green space and trails. And so we have mapped just under 3,000 miles of off-road trails and 96,000 hectares of green space across Northern Ireland. And that will, we're going to do, uh, it's just coming to an end, that project, and then we'll be doing some PR and some training and communication and that. So that's something you'll hear a lot more about within the next six months. We've also been working with many of you guys, uh, particularly the local authorities, and actually delivering trails on the ground. And so we now have a whole network of community trails, particularly in this area, Mary Morton Down, uh, in ABC Council area, in Fermanagh area, and in Arts North Down. So I know the officers we've been working with in each of those councils are here today. Um, you know, that's all about providing doorstep opportunities for local people so that they literally can walk out of the door, they've something safe and they've something off room to be able to go walking on. So that's just some of the work that we've been involved with in Northern Ireland. Um, we've also certainly strengthened our partnerships and our relationships um, across the border. and. Um, 
For the last couple of years, we've been working very closely with the government departments in the site to help facilitate the new national outdoor recreation strategy for uh, the south of Ireland. Um, Helen Lawless is here. Helen is the vice chair of that group that we've worked with over the last couple of years. And we ourselves as an organisation have learned a lot through that process and hopefully now we'll be able to bring these learnings again back, back up to Northern Ireland. <coughs> So just before I hand over to our MC for the day, Brendan has already mentioned uh, we're not expecting any fire, so please follow the, the fire drill as he mentioned. Please ensure that all your phones are on silent um, and be respectful to the panel experts. Um, the sessions are going to be recorded and Jane will be running around taking photographs throughout the day. So if, if you're not comfortable with being in photographs, just let, let Jane know. Uh, everybody should have received a barista mug on your yes. Um, so for the last two years, I think nowadays, uh, Barista has come on board with us to help sponsor our website, Walk and I. And um, so that's the relationship between ourselves and um, Barista. So you'll need to take those with you at the coffee break to get your tea and coffee. Um, please do join us um, um, in social media as the day goes on. Um, just to say your running order of the day is on your lanyard and also hopefully coming up on the screen. I'm back to front of the slide, Elizabeth. Apologise for that. Um, but in terms of social media, you will see if you're one of these people who like to tweet um, and do all of that great stuff, um, you'll see um, the hashtags. So, um, this is such an important event for us today. So, we have brought in the professionals to help us run it. Um, and I'm delighted to hand over the rest of the day to Graham Little Graham. You'll all know from seeing Graham on TV, and um, uh, Graham's a TV presenter and a journalist, um, but he also has a real love for the outdoors, um, and he's, he's tackled some of the world's greatest sporting events um, to date. So Graham, we're delighted to have you here. Graham is going to facilitate uh, the rest of the day for us, and I'll just wrap up at the very end. Thank you very much. Thing. I just forgot how short I am, right? <laughs> uh, lovely to be here, Carmen. Thank you very much for that intro. Uh, beautiful day, obviously, to be in the morns. Where else would you rather be when the weather is like that? I always say that a bit more than Ireland. When we get days like this, there is really nowhere else in the world I'd rather be. Of course, the problem is we don't often get days like this, but they are very special when they do get here, especially because for the last couple of years, most of us have been inhabiting Planet Zoom. Uh, which is where we were working and, and socialising, which I find a hateful experience. Um, my own experience as a pandemic, other than that, was a bit like my own experience of, of having children. I felt that it was slightly scary, but also novel and exciting at the start, before very quickly becoming um, repetitive, <laughs> restrictive, <laughs> frustrating and financially ruinous. Um, I knew that we'd all had enough of COVID in my house when my wife looked me squarely in the eye last spring and told me that if we got quarantined in a lockdown together ever again, it would definitely not be the virus that killed me. <laughs> um, but we, we were really lucky. Uh, we lived just off the coast in Bangor, so we were legitimately allowed on the, the coastal path for our daily exercise. We could go down to the beach through some of the woodlands that are around there. We've got a garden. And, and, and the best thing about the whole experience um, for me and something that probably sadly will never be repeated was the sheer joy of getting out cycling in all the hills around Craig and areas like that down the Arts Peninsula with quiet roads. Um, first time in my life that the only place I was travelling was under my own steam uh, and that ironically felt like, like a kind of freedom. And I kind of was very conscious that all of that time that we got to spend together outdoors in nature and exercising was, was really an absolute blessing. And, and paradoxically, I think many of us probably, considering it was a pandemic, have never felt healthier. Um, but I, I do know that that certainly wasn't everybody's experience. I'm, I'm very well aware of how lucky we are to live, not just where I live in Bangor, but here in general in Northern Ireland, you know, to have the incredible variety of landscape and outdoor experience that we have also closest 
I just find it um, so life enhancing and all of you here today play very important roles uh, in that. Um, I was enjoying sea swimming again as well during that time until someone decided there was a risk that COVID could be spread across the waves from Bangor to Carrick Fergus. Uh, from one of the little harbours that we got going, that we were going in from, so they, they closed that harbour down, which was a peculiar decision. But to be fair, it was a, it was a very peculiar time, and I felt that that was sort of emblematic of some of the issues that emerged uh, during COVID and and with our approach to access to the outdoors and what that was about, what sort of a right it was, and what sort of responsibilities we had within that. Um, I think a lot of public bodies were in a very difficult position then trying to balance those decisions around public use of outdoor spaces, access issues, considerations about how to address very significant health issues other than COVID, um, especially with the incontrovertible evidence that we have of how important getting outdoors can be to our health and our general well-being. Um, I think it was a crazy time that will in inform a lot of the decisions that we make, are making now and will continue to make in the future. And all of you who are working in various capacities in uh, or with outdoor recreation, it's, I imagine, been a really transformative few years uh, for the first time in all of our lives. There was no recreation other than outdoor recreation. So I'm sure it was surely a, you know, it's a huge opportunity, but also a huge challenge. As I mentioned, I remember you know, the issues of access, the overcrowding in a lot of areas that caused local tensions and, and a lot of issues that are still being dealt with. Um, and the fallout, I think, if you like, from that wider pandemic experience will, will definitely inform much of what we talk about today across the three sessions. Uh, talking about this with Chris earlier, I'm sure you all recognise it. It seemed to accelerate existing trends and, and accelerate the challenges that were already there and force important conversations around outdoor life, climate crisis, sustainability, how we balance our lives with, with nature and wildlife and how all of that urgently needs to be managed and all of you in the room here today have, have significant skin in that game as they say. So really today I think we've got plenty to be getting on with. Um, we're going to address all of those issues through the three panel sessions. The first one will be on outdoor recreation and health. The second one, second one will be on outdoor recreation and the environment. And the final one this afternoon will be about outdoor recreation and local communities. They will consider existing successful initiatives that are already delivering healthy people, healthy communities and a healthy environment, as well as discussions on the future role that outdoor recreation must play. So we're here to be inspired to share information and to network and hopefully have a bit of crack as well. In her um, briefing notes that she was preparing for me yesterday, Elizabeth suggested that these sessions be more Graham Norton than Mastermind. Um, <laughs> I share a Christian name with Graham Norton, but, but not much else, sadly. But hopefully we can try and make these entertaining. Uh, as well as informative. So please welcome our first panel who will discuss health and outdoor recreation. They are Mike McClure, Hannah Deary, Martin Carey and Kevin O'Neill. I decided to stay up here out of the way because I would prefer that most of the chat comes from these four amongst themselves. I will interject occasionally when we have to steer stuff but ultimately this is a conversation between you four and between me hundred other people in this cellar crowd not to put you under any pressure. Um, we we'll start in true Graham Norton style, we're trying to find some light uh, common ground. So perhaps if the four of you just tell us which is your uh, preferred personal outdoor activity. So will I kick off then? Yes please. Um, so uh, some of you will know that I am the sea. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I'm, I'm, I've got webbed feet, I've got semi webbed fingers and I spend a lot of time in the water. My main sport is kayaking and canoeing. Um, and mostly on the sea, but I still enjoy rivers and lakes and things. I secretly enjoy a bike quite a lot as well, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm really still fixated on the water. Thank you, Mike. Hannah? Uh -huh. Morning, everyone. Um, I love to be outdoors, I love to be in the sea, and I love to walk. I love to walk anywhere in the forest, in the mountains. I would actually it was in Beaver Forest in Belfast on Sunday, and someone stopped me, a family friend, and was like, you on a panel on Thursday about your right recreation. I said, yeah, really, up I'm meeting you in the forest and you're talking to me about that. So I like to walk and just walk and walk and walk. <laughs> I'm good. Um, well, I suppose I have to say to my life, I, I usually thought about what I used to do. I used to run marathons, I used to do walking challenges. Now it's kind of a, a walk up Cape Hill every now and then. Um, but uh, generally, obviously, we're from a sports background, but uh, really, really interested in outdoors as well. 
Yeah, and for me it depends on the time of year. Uh, <laughs> as, as a Dundrum man, most of the year it's walking at Murdoch. Um, but in the good weather, I like to stand out on the road bike to a good coffee shop. <laughs> Big shout out for picnic and kill away. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Other coffee shops are available. <laughs> Thank you for that, Pamela. Um, the first thing we wanted to address this morning is, is what lessons do you feel were learnt uh, in recent years? And, and again, as I said, the pandemic experience is bound to inform most of this conversation, I would, I would imagine, that's the context which we're still uh, living in. Um, but what lessons were learnt in recent years on the, on the importance of getting into nature for our, our health and well-being? You go first, Mike. Yeah, so are we going to just end up having this pattern? <laughs> no, I'm not going to make it up. I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I guess you know, a, a lot of us have really been focused for many years on, on showcasing the benefits that being in the outdoors have for mental well being, for physical health. You know, and, and I was involved in a project that started in 2018 that actually put economic values on those benefits. Um, and, and we all believed in it. Um, and then it just came real, I think, during uh, following COVID. And I think, other parts of society woke up to the outdoors. Um, a, a, a colleague in Sport Ireland said to me at one stage, said, um, you know, Ireland, uh, during, during the pandemic or after the pandemic, Ireland woke up and found the outdoors, you know, and, and uh, it, it's still there. You know, people are still finding it and still using it. Um, I, I think the other thing is that possibly government agencies and government ministers are now slowly still waking up to the fact of how important our natural environments actually are, you know, for people's health, but also for planetary and, and climate uh, issues. So I, I think, you know, th these things are interlinked. I, I was at a conference last year and, and with the head of the European Environment Agency there, and he, and, he, and he really hit the nail on the head. He said there are four crises that we're facing at the moment. There's a climate crisis we hear lots about. There's a biodiversity crisis that we hear a fair bit about. There's an unsustainable consumption crisis that we hear almost nothing about. And there's a huge human health crisis. And all four of those things are inextricably linked. Um, and I think the outdoors may not be the panacea, but it actually is a really important part of it. Um, mm -hmm. so. Thank you. <coughs> Looks like it's me, we're going on the land. Um, so yeah, from the um, pandemic, we were obviously all allowed out um, for our physical activity. And you know it's really well documented how um, being outside, taking physical activity, can be really beneficial beneficial to our mental health. But I suppose within the public health agency, we're really thinking around the whole system, the whole system approach at the minute to tackling obesity, which is a huge issue. And, you know what you're saying that um, you know a crisis that we're in. So we can really see that how blue and green spaces can really be part. Um, a really important part of that and um, the Department of Health are leading on the development of a new strategy for um, tackling um, and preventing obesity and they have been doing um, workshops and they focus around healthy um, places and settings and within that then um, outdoor recreation is a key part to try and help encourage people to meet the um, CMO guidelines for increasing physical activity but it's just one part and um, it's one part of that whole system and we need to think about how it's a systems approach, it's policy development, it's strategy development and it's not focused on the individual and the individual choices that people have to make. It's much wider than that and a much bigger issue. Um, so, you know, it's all so very linked. So I'm, um, I'm here with my um, very strategic hat on and not just focusing on physical activity for our, um, for our physical health, but more around how that whole system approach can be taken and adapted um, for use within Northern Ireland. It's, it's a difficult thing to, to measure or quantify, Hannah, isn't it? Well being. I suppose we quantify health by how many people are not in hospital, maybe. I don't know, you know, you tell me, but how do you? How do we begin to kind of measure well-being? Because it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult concept to quantify, does that make it more challenging for you to go and, and pitch the case to, to politicians and then decision makers? Yeah, absolutely. Working in public health, we have to think about what are our outcomes and how do, and how do we measure them. And so when we think about um, well-being, when you think about that kind of mental well-being, and there are obviously scores that can be done. Um, there are also limitations with um, measuring things. Um, there are debates around the measurement of um, BMI um, as a classification for obesity, but we need to use something. 
So, you know, it's kind of the best measurement that we have at this point in time. So I suppose they're the measures that we look at to kind of see, like, where are we going? Um, what impact are we having? And at the minute, the obesity levels are still rising. So what we're doing isn't right yet. And that's kind of why we need to think about one of the wider systems that will help change. Kevin, have you got um, an experience you'd like to share about the lessons that were learned in, in, in recent years and on the importance of, of nature for health and well being? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we obviously were involved in lots, lots of sports, lots of activities, lots of outdoor activities, and uh, during COVID, you know, almost everything stopped. The stuff that continued was the outdoor stuff. You know, the walking, the Nordic walking we're doing, the outdoor projects, um, in Gosford Forest Park, for example, where we have uh, all three electric vehicles, and they don't wheelchair users to have physical facilities to access the outdoors. So during COVID, it you know, desperate times, and there's a it, it disproportionately affected disabled people. You know, we know that now it's not of COVID. So before COVID, disabled people are half as likely to be involved in any type of sport or active recreation. Um, we're trying to get the figures now as we come out of COVID, but certainly in our programs, you know, all the sporty, sporty people are back doing their competitive sport, but the community activities are down to 30 to 40 percent. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really had a negative impact for disabled people. Um, we don't know why that is, but we're still trying to learn that, it, but it's people's support structures just weren't there anymore. People got into the habit of taking part. Uh, and, and like everyone, you know, see what people were using trails and greenways during COVID to try to be active, to cycling, tandem cycling, um, but it had a disproportionately negative effect. So for us, I suppose, it's, um, you know, outdoor uh, activities are almost the easiest activities to, to adapt and to include disabled people, but the physical environment out there is still quite poor. So when this was all these four that I was set up uh, just over 20 years ago, that uh, was because leisure facilities and sports clubs weren't accessible and disabled people said this isn't acceptable. Over the last 20 years that's transformed. You could, it'd be hard to find a, a, a sports leisure facility now in Northern Ireland that had not good levels of access. So I think in, in terms of the outdoors, it's a kind of, I, I think we're in the cost of a lot of change. There's a lot of expectation uh, prompted by disabled people to use the outdoors. Mm -hmm. There's a greater expectation that the outdoors should be as accessible as possible. Uh, and, uh, and on the positive <coughs> side, there's a lot of interest uh, from local authorities, from sports organisations, coming to organisations like us and say, well, how can we make the environment more accessible? Uh, and just at the end of COVID, as a, as a result of all that, we produced the first ever accessible outdoor places guide, which is a technical guide designed for architects and designers, which is saying, here's what you can do to improve so much in terms of the outdoor environment. It's everything from walkways, greenways, um, bird hides, picnic tables, you know, you name it, accessible playgrounds, access to water. Uh, so there's a lot of good practice out there in Northern Ireland and further afield, but I do think we're on the cusp of actually a lot more than needing to happen. So you're right. Martin, can I ask you to pick up on a point that Mike made uh, when he was saying that we're seeing now more parts of society discovering the outdoors during COVID. Has that been your experience in the Morn area in terms of who was accessing the wealth of spectacular locations that you have? Yeah, absolutely. Prem, the whole world changed down here. I think uh, the comedian Paddy Rath put it quite well during COVID when he said uh, lockdown wasn't going to be lifted until everyone in Northern Ireland had had a selfie on top of Sleep Donner. <laughs> <laughs> it, it did feel like that. It did feel like it was almost obligatory. Um, and social media was one of the big drivers. But the, the, we've seen so many changes. I guess the headlines are uh, more young people more family groups and more women mm -hmm. um, and uh, particularly in and around the Moor Mountains. Now, what, one of the difficulties and challenges of that has been because they're relatively new users, a lot of them, they've gravitated towards what were already the key honeypots, whereas the more regular users whose interest grew organically over the years would find the lesser known spots. So the like of the Glen River, Ot Track, uh, Carrick Little, mm -hmm. Trassy, as people will know, we've been just overrun this last one. But a few other, uh, I guess, more subtle things that we'd have seen, um, as well as the descent on the honeypots, definitely people discovering places near them. We the, the Green Lane network of public rights of way across this area, which many of them lay relatively unused for years. People have now discovered what they have on their doorstep. Uh, and similar to as Carla mentioned, the community trails have been very popular as well. Um, the swimming's taken off massively in the mountain lakes and the mountains as well as in the sea. Uh, and uh, and then we're seeing a lot of canine users as well. It's another big thing. Like dog ownership shot up 
over the pandemic, but I think we also have a sense that people are now more prepared to bring their dogs to the hills. Uh, in the past, maybe people who were coming wouldn't have brought the dogs, uh, where it's becoming quite common now, and that has its pros and cons, and there's been some issues with the impact on livestock, etc. Um, so those would be the big changes we have seen, and I guess I suppose a, almost a democratisation of of outdoor recreation, if I could put it that way. And what we're seeing a lot is more informal groups of of hikers who just gather themselves up. People like the the hiking hens and the happy hikers. A lot, lot of alliteration going on. Thirsty Thursdays is another one. Like some of my That's like the other one. Yeah. It's a good one, isn't it? Uh, so these are where folk, um, they're stressing on their posts that they're not qualified guides, but they're just like-minded groups of people who are getting together because they want to get out and get a bit of exercise. Um, and uh, and yeah, so that's those would be the, the, the key things we've seen. So that's the experiences you've had. How what's happening in the future? Who's doing the kind of crystal ball gazing, Mike, in terms of reflecting these changes in, in any any new policy and strategy? Do you want an honest answer? Or do we yeah, have, <laughs> I want an honest one and then up the camera. Okay. I don't think I don't think that's happened in all honesty. Um, and no, it's quite sad, it really sad to say that, but you know, I, th I think, as I mentioned, there is an awareness growing, but I, I'm not sure that there is a genuine desire at a political level to, to optimise the opportunities for people to be active and healthy in our outdoor environments. Um, I, I don't see those policy changes coming at any speed at all. Um, we developed an outdoor recreation action plan back in 2013, um, and it's been a struggle. To keep to make to keep it alive and keep it moving forward, you know, and um, sports outdoors in my sector in the sports sector it, it's a small part part of the overall sports sector, which is a small part of the Department of Communities, you know, a very small part of the Department of Communities. So at a political level, you know, outdoors is just a way down here, and yet at a public level, it's a way up here. So at, there is a disparity between the policies and the, the and certainly the legislation. I mean, Martin highlighted this really well, you know, that the Mourns became inundated. But that's because the Mourns are where you can go. You know, actually, where can you go in Northern Ireland? We have the most restrictive access of anywhere in Europe. Anywhere. And, um, like, it's just, it's shocking. People cannot access the outdoors in Northern Ireland uh, compared to other parts of the UK, Ireland, and Europe. Um, it, it's, it's really limiting. Look, I was up in the Sparrows yesterday with some guys, and we were talking about the Sparrows. The biggest mountain range in Northern Ireland, biggest mountain range, who goes there? Very few people, because you don't know where to go and there's no access. Um, the Andrew Hills, difficult to access, you know, nobody's quite sure where they can go. Um, our, 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 Martin mentioned the Public Rights of Way Network. Around here, we've got quite good Public Rights of Way Network, it's, it's, but that's quite unique in Northern Ireland. Wales has approximately 55, 60,000 miles of Public Rights of Way. England is over 300,000 miles. We're in the hundreds and low hundreds. Low hundreds of miles of public rights way. Now we do have some permissive paths, and there's great work going on to develop community trails. And I was really heartened whenever the community planning process started because the outdoors, access to nature, green space is really highlighted in all of the district council community plans. And that is that that for me is is as a sign of what can happen in the future. But again, it's not really being realised. And maybe COVID had an impact on the delivery of those community plans, and we're maybe only getting back to that now. Some councils, I think, are really picking up that. But at a governmental level in Northern Ireland, it's just not happening. We don't have one. That doesn't help. Well, that doesn't help. But even even then, I think you know we're we're, we're struggling with it. Yeah. I I would really like to um, come in on the back of that, not just because we're going in line. Um, but you know, you talked about the Department for Communities. I very much align with the Department of Health, and you know, we are looking at how we can develop that um, new obesity strategy and really have that um, physical activity and outdoor space within that. But we very much need to focus on um, deprivation and and closing that inequalities gap as well. And through the workshops that have been. Um, facilitated by the Department of Health, they said that the biggest thing that um, people who came to the workshop said is that they want access to green and blue spaces 
and they want access from their home and they want to just be able to get out into it. So it's not necessarily mountain ranges if we think about where the pockets of inequalities are. They're nowhere near the you know the beautiful places that you're talking about. They just need to just get out and walk, but they don't feel that even that is accessible to them. Also, when we think about our um, like weight stigma um, lens on as well, there are people who could get out, but actually then if they walk along a greenway, there are there are no seats for them to stop and rest, and they feel that it is too challenging then to go out and go for a big walk. It's too much. And so we need to think about how we make that accessible for everyone that they get out and do a few steps and then they do sit and they take notice and you know we think around um, other um, initiatives that we have around take five to be sociable, you can talk, you can stop, um, you can people watch, you can make eye contact with people and smile at them, you can take notice, you can listen to your environment and you can be physically active so that's three of the take five already to improve your mental health. So it, you know, it's sad to hear that you don't really feel like anything's happening. The cogs of public sector turn so slowly, and the mm -hmm. fact that we don't have a government is particularly slow at the minute. But we really, we really, it's all on our agenda. You know, we want to get it there, and it is around that. You know, everything that we can do, and this is one small part of it, and um, that we want to make sure is in and it's accessible and it closes that inequalities gap. I just, I mean, I think that. You know, and, and that's that's almost the point. The Department of Health are doing certain things. Department of Commun Communities are doing certain things. Department of Environment are doing certain things. And, and and at times it comes together. But that's the problem and the advantage of outdoor recreation. It is cross cutting. It doesn't just sit with sport and recreation and communities. It doesn't just sit with health. It doesn't just sit with uh, environment. It actually includes tourism and, and economic development as well. And it needs a much stronger, cohesive approach, intergovernmental approach. Um, and there are efforts to make that happen. And the Action Plan highlighted, you know, a strategic outdoor recreation group to make that happen. But, but you know, that, that hasn't really coalesced yet, I think is the thing. Now, maybe the, the, the outcomes of the pandemic will help that to happen. And maybe when we get a government, there will be more coalescence on it. But I think that that's, it's critical that there is that interdepartmental working because it does not rest with one department alone. And if it does, it fails. Do you think possibly, again, this is a question for everybody in the panel, is it more difficult to make the case, the health and well-being case of access to outdoor recreation, because it is difficult to, to quantify and to measure? If, if there were stats that we could put up, would you grab the attention of the politicians much easier in your experience, I guess? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. I would agree with Mike in, in general terms. You know, with recreation, outdoor recreation is a sort of relation in terms of you know, the, broader, uh, the broader sector. Um, I do think the thing that everyone misses is that if we really want a broad representation, I'm putting disabled people in that, we need to target inactive people. So half the population, whatever you look at the stats, half the population leads seven very inactive life sites. All the underrepresented groups, that's where they, they, were, where they were. In our experience, when I started off years ago, I assumed that okay, disabled people would get the uh, breakdown barriers, develop links with clubs, and people would go from being inactive into clubs. The reality is that doesn't happen. So inactive disabled people don't go from being inactive into sports club and competitive sports. They go into the low level recreational activities, a lot of which are in the outdoors. <laughs> um, so I would agree with uh, Mike from our, from our perspective, certainly there's more awareness and more understanding of the need to make uh, outdoor places accessible across the sector. Uh, you talk about the Department for Communities there, I mean, they have a, a small grant scheme around access and inclusion, but very much a focus on making active recreation and outdoor recreation opportunities accessible. So that's, that's starting to happen, but I totally agree with Mike. It feels very uh, uh, bitsy in its approach. You know, so for example, the Public Health Agency funded our Accessible Outdoor Places Guide. Fantastic, great. DFC will introduce a new grant scheme. Great. Sport and I do bits and pieces, but those feel very, um, certainly not joined up in terms of all approach. And certainly, it's my thing, uh, uh, you know, what we all need to do, whether it's the sport, active recreation, or outdoor recreation, is to target and active people. And if you do that, you achieve everything that you need to achieve. Tell us about the design guidelines that, that have been developed. Was it was that your organisation, or was that again a sort of a cross-platform? No, no, that was the project developed in disability sport and in consultation with lots of stakeholders. It was funded by the public health agency, uh, and it covers everything. But it's, it's it's the small things make the difference. So uh, as Hannah said, there you go. If you have a mobility difficulty, if you have resting places on a walking trail, you space appropriately. 
uh, or benches, it makes a difference uh, from being able to go for, for, for a walk or a push or, or whatever. Um, and it's the same in the adult environment. If you design things to be inclusive, it doesn't cost any more. If you try to adapt things afterwards, it costs more. So uh, it, may, it makes sense that you know, when we're designing things, uh, they become accessible. One of the very notable things happened, uh, it's in the edge of our world, I suppose, but during COVID, it was a huge increase in demand from parents that their local play park was accessible. Because they were taking the kid along the local play park, and there was more equipment that they could use. Uh, so a lot of clients you know, introduced accessible equipment you know, to uh, different degrees of, of success. So I suppose what we would say is it's thinking ahead, and planning your inclusion, and making small changes. Those are the things that make the difference. Now, in the other extreme, we've got a lot of expensive equipment, cost for forest park, and adapted vehicles uh, that get people in the you know, mountain, uh, get people the mountain bike experience. Um, so there's, there's room for that and we need that, but most of it is small changes. But during COVID, probably one of the best uh, things in my career happened is that <coughs> we were working with a group in Gosford Forest Park, and a guy in his 50s who uh, had a car accident when he was 20, and he said, I never thought I'd be in a forest again. Uh, and you know, talk about how you measure well being. Uh, you know, we've had people who flipped the buggies, and uh, he's used my language. I said, What did he say afterwards? And he said, That was effing brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not good for my insurance, but anyway. Um, so yeah, yeah. So I do, I do think uh, for me, um, for lots of organisations, the um, the capacity of the outdoor offer uh, to actually be more inclusive to really realise and better understand during COVID. Uh, but I do think uh, it doesn't seem to be a very joined up approach in terms of helping to get us there. Well, there must be some um, good practice examples though, Martin, where, where, where things are working well. What, what sort of programs are, are run here that enhance health and, and well-being through yeah, the outdoor yeah. recreation? There are, um, and actually I suppose as, as an intro to that, if I could just quickly react to the comments made there, with which I would wholeheartedly agree, but with a, a slight nuance of difference in it. I've actually found the politicians quite easy to convince of the, va of the value of the outdoors. I think what is really sadly progress, and you touched on it, Mike, is we lack the mechanisms to deliver. You know, your question, Graham, is do we have enough evidence of the value of the outdoors? Uh, I think there's still a lot of research that shows that. And, and in a way, COVID made that case for us. For us. It was so <coughs> obvious. Everybody in, in any politician I spoke to wanted to open up more access to our outdoors, but we lack the mechanisms to make that happen through structural things like fragmentation of government responsibilities for what is very much a cross cutting thing, year to year budgets, and uh, a fragmented and insecure sector for delivery. So not only are the activities fragmented, but actually the bodies that deliver for us on the ground, more now just trust forty, etc., our very existence is insecure because of year to year funding. So uh, yeah, so look, that's the downside. Sorry for the depressive <laughs> first of all, but um, I would end up actually back at that point, unfortunately. But yeah, some of the, the positive programs we have had, um, our engagement rangers are in the back of at the back of the room there and. That has been hugely well received and overwhelmed with the positive reaction from people uh, on the hills to those folk whose role is to be out and about and engaging with people to ensure that they have a quality experience and they feel confident to repeat the experience. And they've been particularly important with that big audience that we now have of what we call new users. Um, and, and encouraging people to keep up the habits by dispensing good advice on kits planning, etc., all of that stuff. Um, and reaching out to groups that ha ha don't particularly use the outdoors. So that, that's been a huge positive. Um, other things, that we, we've made progress with some of the infrastructure. So one of the walks today, some of you will be on, will see the pathworks we've done on the Glen River track. Um, and we've done that very much with a mind in the design and execution to that new user group, as well as the Avid Hill Walker, in that there are there are lots of different ways to pick your way through the trail. You're not led in one line, and there's lots of little natural stopping points to appreciate a little beach grove or an oak grove or see the river. Uh, and for those who only want a short walk, then they get the sense of a natural conclusion. We used to see on Donard a lot that fairly casual users would start walking and just not know where to stop. Mm. So we give them stopping time and turning points and, and uh, places to appreciate. 
and, and get that spiritual well-being that people talk about from the outdoors. Um, so those are two very important ones. Community trails that Orney, Orney have worked on has been a positive development. Um, and also in the past what we have found, uh, one of our most successful projects is our Active Life Science, which was funded by Big Lottery to provide nature experiences for marginalised groups. So people with special educational needs, asylum seekers, uh, etc. And again, the feedback we got from those groups was so striking and, and, and just about how they felt. Uh, the asylum seeker folk coming from war-torn South Sudan, finding themselves not particularly welcomed in the big city, from rural areas themselves, just love the escape, the oxygen, the breathing space of getting down here, working with our volunteers, feeling welcome, being in the outdoors, and it was so profound. The, the big regret for us is that, as with a number of the other projects, the funding stopped. So we're back to that point that we talked about, the short termism. Uh, the path team that you'll see on the Glen River today uh, started with us in August and will have to disperse at the end of March because it wasn't even year-to-year -year funding, it was in-year funding. And our engagement ranger team at the moment were in a similar boat where we go with funding to continue that programme beyond the 1st of April. And like, not only are people on the ground saying to us that that should continue, they're saying things like, why wasn't this? Why, why weren't the rangers out here before? This is true. <coughs> this should have been here for years. So uh, yeah, lots of good stuff happening, but a, in a way, a lot of catch up to even cater for the level of demand we saw pre-COVID. Um, so we we will just continue to keep highlighting those positive examples and hope that we can find mechanisms within government, particularly with multi-year funding, to, to make them sustainable. Mm. What sort of funding programmes are there are through Sport and I might that help to, to promote outdoor recreation for health and well-being? So, I mean, we, we, we've, we're currently looking at the new fund for governing bodies of sports, so, and, and what's really positive, I would say, is that we've had a, a shift, whereas in the past, the funding would have focused on Olympic and Commonwealth uh, sports, and, and only they would have got funded. Um, and a lot of the outdoor sports never really got the opportunity to access that funding. Um, whereas now it's been much more open. So we're seeing all of the uh, outdoor sports governing bodies looking to put in submissions and, and actually getting reasonable levels of funding going forward to support them, to help deliver on, on those opportunities. And particularly for disadvantaged communities, that's one of our, our priority areas. So, so there's that element. Obviously, we have a long-term commitment to outdoor recreation NI to support the work that they do. We, along with the Department of Environment, set them up. So we kind of have a responsibility, as we did with Disability Sport, we, we co-set them up. So it's, it's important that we continue strategic funding of those organisations and not just year-to-year, uh, -year, as Martin said, funding. We, we have actually a slightly different model that we try and provide slightly longer-term funding, which usually three or five-year funding, uh, which helps. It's still not perfect, but it helps. Um, we also have a small pot of funding that we support uh, community planning projects and as I mentioned at the start, so many of those um, projects end up being outdoor projects because a lot of the community plan talks about the environment and health and well-being and the outdoors fit so well. And some, like some of my colleagues refer to it sometimes as my private pot. It's not really, you know, it's open to anyone, but it, it's just that it, it works so well for the, the community planning project. But it's small scale. Um, and, and we will have infrastructure funding in the future as well. Um, and, and there's definitely an appetite to open that up to some of the outdoor uh, sports and outdoor opportunities as well. I, I, I would go back to what you said as well in, in terms of you know, bringing opportunities to people and not necessarily always having to take people to the opportunities. Um, those doorstep opportunities are going to be critical going forwards, you know, where people don't have to get into their car and travel to the Mourns or the Sparrows or the Fermanagh Lakes, you know, because that's inaccessible for some people. And providing opportunities where people live it, it is really important. And it's great to see things like Belfast Hills opening up the Lagan Corridor and things, but actually sometimes rural communities are really disadvantaged. Um, it's not just the urban ones, there's actually quite a lot of urban green space in Northern Ireland, but some of our rural communities are the most disadvantaged in terms of access to nature for health and well-being, for walking and cycling and, and things. I mean, if you think about even children learning to ride bikes, now where can you take children to safely ride bikes? It's really restrictive. Um, across Northern Ireland, we need more 
greenways and, and opportunities where there are safe places that the kids can go and ride, and um, close to where people live. I mean, I, I think that's really important. And it goes back to those crises we talked about. You know, we talk about a climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis. Well, let's increase nature in our urban environments. Let's increase access to nature in, in our rural environments um, and, and give people those health and well-being opportunities. Mm. Um, um, I, I think it's really nice that you kind of um, led into initiatives of the public health agency or doing around active travel um, and you talked about community planning and how that's been around for such a long time. We now have the new ICS which is the integrated care uh, systems as well to try and work together but really around the active travel um, we fund projects in communities and workplaces and in schools and I um, I lead on the after school travel program and that's um, a regional program and it's to encourage children to actively travel to school but not just that, obviously that's within the name of it but it's to increase physical activity and increase those physical activity opportunities um, and we jointly fund that with the Department for Infrastructure and SUSTRANS are the delivery organisation for that um, so there's great partnership working um, <coughs> on trying to increase physical activity for children, but we obviously know that children don't sit on their own, they live within families that are within <coughs> communities, and then those parents as well who drop them to school can potentially be going on to workplaces. So at the minute the Public Health Agency are commissioning an evaluation of the three programmes to see how we can better work together and better have um, an offering of active travel to um, to increase that um, activity and not necessarily be um, a, you know, a sport that you go out and do or specifically a recreation that, it, that it's just part of your everyday and to try and build that into the everyday. So those are some of the projects that you know, we're working on at the minute. Um, there's room for improvement but um, you know, there, there are great outcomes as well. The after school travel program last year reached um, over 122,000 people, so that's through pupils, teachers, parents who then get involved in examples are like walking buses, so they maybe park in a nearby church car park or community venue car park and then they walk to their school. Because again, we talk about um, safety for children um, on cycling. Safety uh, is, is a huge barrier that um, parents come up to come up against with the after school travel program and um, through this program we're kind of trying to think of well, what are safer ways to increase the physical activity. There's also training around cycle skills as well so that the children have the knowledge and skills to be able to cycle on non-busy roads but again um, that's not for every school. And um, the urban rural mix as well is a huge one and um, there, there are more opportunities for active travel within the urban settings obviously but um, we don't want to then um, have a disadvantage of those rural schools so there are still then opportunities within the school day and um, the active travel officers do um, activities with them out the playground that you measure your resting heartbeat, then you walk five lengths of whatever to find um, in the playground, you measure your heart rate again, then you do your running of that, you measure your heart rate again, and then two minutes later you see is your heart rate coming down. So it's, it's that health and physical activity and increasing your physical activity that really we want to instill. Um, in that there was something else in my head, but I've lost my train of thought, so I should maybe let someone else <laughs> talk when I come to it. Can, can I pick up on that urban? Uh, rural disparity that Mike mentioned and that I haven't picked up on. Do you find that in uh, particularly for you know disabled sport access or people with long term illnesses? Is, is that a fact? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do, I do think there's a tendency um, where all the progress has been is in kind of the, the safe spaces, you know, the, uh, the uh, riverside paths and greenways that are really great, at least easily accessible. But certainly, disabled people can have opportunities to do the wider things. You know, and visit wider spaces. Uh, now, of course, no one's saying that you know we need to take away chair users, obviously, dollar or whatever. But it's amazing, you know, when you talk to individual disabled people, what they feel they can do with lots of small changes. And one of the things when we were developing guy is, um, and I, I myself wasn't aware of it when I walk in the, in the Belfast Hills or Cape Hill. You know, there's a whole range of bikes, or sorry, uh, gates and styles which seem pointless, you know, and could be very easily made accessible. 
uh, um, you know, so there's a lot of basic stuff, um, picking up on Mike's point, you know, close to where people live, you know, the city parks, the, you know, the, the K Hill, or the Belfast Hills and other places, where small changes can make a massive difference. Mm -hmm. But the whole focus of today is on health, and the uh, thing, again, I think people miss, and of course, Hannah's right, you know, the young, young people are a very important uh, target group. But as I, said, I think I said earlier, the stats came out just before Christmas on the number of disabled people in Northern Ireland. It's 24% of the population now have a disability or long term health condition. That is in the census. And why that is, is because of our population is getting older. So um, most people acquire their disability through life. So if you look at the children, I think it's 6% of children with <coughs> disability. Uh, but uh, as I say, it's 24% of the population. That's, that's one in four. You go to places, uh, local authority areas like Belfast and Derry, it's 27%, so it's more like one in three. Uh, so I actually think, you know, really in terms of everything we all do here, it's actually just focusing on the needs and interests of older people. Uh, you know, it's, you know it's, it's crucially important. Um, because, our, our, you know, disability is the one uh, underrepresented group that we're all likely to join at some point in our lives. You know, it's just the reality. We acquire us about the long-term health conditions. Just trying to see we're not here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I, I, think it, I think it's complex and probably barriers to participation, whatever that is. I think, you know, we work the hardest to reach group. Um, and it's, as I say, my message is, have you to make sure your planning is as close as possible from the outset. Uh, and make small changes and make a big difference, and you can achieve a lot more. Uh, and we all you know, benefit, you know, uh, or enjoy the uh, health and wellbeing benefits of sport or active recreation or outdoor recreation. But again, when it's been denied to people for so long and then get involved again, it feels much more valuable mm -hmm. and, and people appreciate it much more. So, if we have an older society, uh, Martin, and all the problems that are, or the challenges that are likely to come with that, it's far more important that we uh, prioritise access to outdoor education and, and health and well-being. So what sort of practical actions do you feel we can, we can undertake to try and uh, improve the, the provision? Yeah, well, I think for me there's, there's a very simple answer to that, and it's, it's infrastructure and services, but beneath that lies a lot of complexity given, as I touched on earlier, how poorly developed our infrastructure is in particular. I, I think, Kevin, actually, give us a couple of years and you might get a wheelchair up the lower bits of sleep on or we're, we're incrementally working at that and and yeah it's opening up the, the spaces like Donner Forest, the community trails, public rights of way on people's doorsteps and um, as Mike touched upon taking the pressure off our honey pots like the Mourns would be a huge help. Uh, the Sparrows being a prime example. I don't want to fall out if this gets back to the farmers and the Sparrows. I don't want to make an enemy of them. <laughs> the, a lot of that need for recreation the pressure is falling on our more farmers um, I, I was chased twice from the sparrows on, in one day <laughs> not that long ago on walks that i have understood to be quite well recognized one of them actually was featured in the london edition of the times so we yeah for me we have a massive untapped resource in this country and it's really uh, it's the long-term investment to provide the car parks the toilets often overlooked hugely crucial uh, and the sustainable routes uh, near people to be able to capitalise on that and then having the services in, in the form of rangers etc to ensure that people are encouraged to keep up that activity and get the best value out of it. Now that sounds simple but to go back to Mike's point, for me then therefore that needs outdoor recreation to be put right at the centre of government not left to one department to drive a bit of it and another to drive the other, but we have an overarching strategy with a commitment of resource that's driven from the top down. So I'd be looking at the likely the Department of Finance or the Executive Office to recognise that access to the outdoors is a fun of fundamental importance to the health of the people, economy and environment of this place uh, and really get serious about it. So other than me phoning Rishi Sunak on his mobile and asking <laughs> to create a new government department, <laughs> when we eventually get out of back in Northern Ireland, are there any other practical examples that you would like to see instigated now to, to try and encourage more people to use the outdoors and improve their health and well being? I, I have two thoughts on that. One is, one is about the infrastructure, which Martin has mentioned. You know, we, we really need to develop infrastructure. There are, are, there are golden opportunities that, that we're not maximising. 
I mean, the work that we're doing, that Or and I are doing on, on community trails, and the councils are doing community trails are phenomenal. But there's another missed opportunity. The light of the toolpath is amazing, and it's really well used. Um, it, it's a great resource that connects Lisburn two towns, Lisburn and Belfast. Great resource along the river corridor. It also provides biodiversity because it, along the corridor there's, there's trees, there's native planting. So, so it's good for the environment, it's really good for people. It's dead simple. All of our towns and communities are connected by rivers. Under the Water Framework Directive at a European level, all of those rivers were supposed to have buffer zones, which is basically native planting alongside those river corridors to protect the rivers and protect our water supply from getting polluted. And they don't have them. In, in the most part. There are some good examples, but the most part don't have them. Imagine if we had all of our river corridors with a 15-20 metre buffer strip, all with a connecting path that connects up every town and village in Northern Ireland. We, we can get anywhere we want in Northern Ireland by car, because the car is king. But we cannot get there by foot or by, by, uh, by, by, cycle. by cycle. Yeah, exactly. And, and so that infrastructure, there's a golden opportunity that would meet environmental needs, it would meet water framework needs, it will improve things, it will improve health, it will improve biodiversity. What's not to like? And, and yet, you know, see, I've brought this up so many times at meetings, different meetings, and people look at you like you've two heads. Well, that'll be too complex. It's not complex, it's very straightforward. We will best land to, to create roads because the car is king. We won't do it for outdoor recreation and for the environment and for health and well-being. Like, there's something seriously wrong. We will invest land to make it happen for um, something that pollutes us, that causes us to be inactive and, de and destroys our health and well-being. Um, but we won't do it for something that's actually positive for society. And the second thing really is animation. So, you know, it, the infrastructure piece is really important. You know, it, there is an element of build it and they will come. But there's also an element of build it and some people won't come. And that goes back to your point that there are some people for whom it is too alien, it is too difficult, it is too challenging. Um, and so being able to animate that for those people who are, are restricted in many different ways, socially, economically, or through disability. And I think, I mean, some of us have been working, we work with the Public Health Agency on a walking for all scheme. Walking is the golden opportunity, isn't it? Because, you know, it, it needs nothing. You know, if you have no income, you can still walk. Um, if, if you're disadvantaged, you can still walk. And people with disabilities then can, can have other forms of transport as well on, those, on that infrastructure. So creating a scheme that encourages people through walking for all could be a, a real game changer. Um, and, and there's a really good model in Scotland that we were looking to replicate here in Northern Ireland that really saw levels of physical activity at a population level <coughs> increase simply through that walking for all programme. And I think that's, we're, we're sitting with a business case ready so there is an opportunity there to do that once we get that and I think that animation piece is really important. It's the, it's the infrastructure and also support for those who need support. Thank you Mike. Final question to you Hannah, uh, final remarks from you before I throw, throw it open to, to the floor for any questions. What can the Public Health Agency do to try and force the agenda on an infrastructure basis? It's a totally different government department but can we pressure applied from a health and well-being perspective to make people rethink how we design infrastructure and what we put in place. Yeah, so we work um, really closely with, with the Department for Infrastructure, so we're 50-50 uh, funders of the Active School Travel Programme, so in that we do have an influencing role, we're building those relationships and every year the Active School Travel Programme develops an audit of infrastructure that's, that is needed to support the Active School Travel Programme, so at this stage that's you know that's what we are presenting every year that's how we are influencing how can these small changes be made to increase active travel so a different a different aspect and um, um I, I love your blue sky thinking i love that and you don't even say this blue sky thinking. No, <laughs> <laughs> but i know that that's how you've been meant before um uh, we, we're thinking a lot um, smaller scale, around 20 mile an hour speed limits outside schools, that they don't even have that. Um, so, yes, I, I think at this stage we do have a good opportunity. We are in partnership with the Department for Infrastructure and we are continually trying to influence how we, how we better improve the infrastructure across Northern Ireland. Thank you. Good note to, to finish off tonight. Any questions from the floor for our panel? I think Elizabeth has a roaming mic, or Chris has a roaming mic. Striding up as we speak. Just a super quick one. 
very much a wildlife lover. And I got very excited about seeing red squirrels here this morning. <laughs> we don't get them in England, well, in only very small, isolated patches, so it's nice to be here. You didn't do the pine marks, then? That's what we did. The pine marks is just great. Uh, you'll be able to one of those. <laughs> How many of your favourite outdoor recreation locations? Um, well, a lot of people in the room will know my drug of choice is hill walking. Mm -hmm. And uh, could say Morris. I live in the Wicklow Mountains, but <laughs> uh, the west of Ireland, probably Connemara and South Mayo for wildness uh, and rugged character to the mountains there. I thought you were going to give a local answer by saying the Morns, even though you live in the White Coast. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love the Morns, but like many people, I probably prefer mountains where I, have, I can have a quieter experience. Um, and while I dearly love the High Morns, uh, they do tend to be busier than Connemara. You may have spoiled it for Connemara. <laughs> <laughs> Maya, your favourite outdoor recreation location? So, um, well, one of them, Belfast Hills, definitely. It's just so accessible um, for, for so many people. And the views, the variety of habitat, um, just just what you can see from the top and the fact that you can go in all weathers, just just fantastic. I would agree with that. Johnny, as a former Olympian, you're not allowed to say somewhere exotic like Rio mm -hmm. or many other beautiful places that you've been to play hockey. Um, where is your favourite outdoor recreation location that, that we may know of? I feel a bit guilty sitting here in this beautiful location saying I'm about half of the North Antrim coast so spending my childhood uh, growing up there in the North Antrim coast in Ballantoy and um, spending my summer holidays up there so White Park Bay um, and around that area would have to be my favourite location. Good on you. Um, it's a pretty simple question but it's also an enormous question. What are the crises that are facing the, the natural world? at the moment, what are we dealing with uh, and um, how can we begin to, to address it? Gosh, that is a big question. <laughs> uh, well, there are multiple problems, aren't there? So obviously there's a biodiversity crisis. We're seeing massive declines in wildlife. Obviously there's the climate change crisis um, and we're seeing that very much now um, playing out in our, in our weather. So. But that's another thing we need to do. Um, I think in the last panel we talked about the human health crisis and the consumption crisis as well. Obviously, I agree with that. So I think in general, to me, it feels like you know if you're taking a step back, I mean, humanity's in crisis. So we we need to deal with these problems because they impact on us, and they're not separate problems; they're integrated. So I think in terms of solution. And obviously there are many and will come in many different forms. We do need to think in a more joined up way about these issues, um, about how we deal with biodiversity and climate change at the same time. Obviously recreation coming into that in terms of human health. Um, so really an integrated, a more integrated approach to thinking about dealing with those challenges would be very, very sensible. How are your thoughts on the challenges that we're facing at the moment? Um, well, I think Mike uh, summed it up really well in the first panel, uh, the four interrelated crises, climate, biodiversity loss, sustainability or overconsumption, and of course the human health crisis, um, but I suppose here we're focused on the, the crises for the natural environment, and I think what is inescapable is those interrelated crises, they're, they're human induced. Uh, they're because, by and large, because of the actions of people. You know, the, the climate one because we're addicted to fossil fuels and there's more carbon in the atmosphere than there has ever been before, and that's now destabilizing our weather patterns and the impact of climate on biodiversity because species are literally on an elevator to extinction. Uh, species that are temperature sensitive in the hills are moving up and then they reach the point where there's nowhere to go. And that phrase was coined uh, decades ago. So we know uh, that it's happening. It's irrefutable at this point. And we all have, we have responsibilities to do better. And of course the pressure on biodiversity is not just uh, from climate. Um, we're literally eating up undeveloped land um, much of it for agriculture to feed an unsustainable food system. 
uh, you know, that is the biggest pressure on biodiversity worldwide, and it's, uh, taking land for agricultural development. Yes, boat development is a factor also. Um, so it does come back to you know, our lifestyle. And Mike uh, pointed out something to me um, at a, an event a couple of weeks back about the uh, Overshoot Day. And I would suggest that everybody checks the website. Overshoot Day refers to the day in the calendar year when a country or the world um, exceeds the natural capacity of the planet uh, to sustain us. And the, for, what I say, for the Republic of Ireland overshoot day this year is the 21st of April. Like it's less than one third of the way through the year. So if everybody, every human being on the planet was to live the way we do in the Western world, or certain, well, I'll deal with the Republic of Ireland figure and then come back to the UK. If everybody was to have the same sort of lifestyle that we have, it would take 3.6, sorry, 3.3 planets to sustain us. Um, the UK figure is slightly better, but not a great deal, it's 2.6 planets. And even globally, um, and we have lots of people who don't have the income or the opportunities to spend that we have globally, it's 1.8. Uh, so it's, we're, we're in a bad place, but I think having that knowledge uh, gives us a responsibility to do it better. Um, we all have choices. We have a lot more in choice than, you know, half of humanity is living in parts of the planet that are under serious threat from the impact of global warming or desertification uh, through droughts. We're not in that position and we have more income. We have more ability to make choices and make changes. And we can't just leave it to government. Um, at the end of the day, politicians are malleable creatures. They're dependent on your votes. And we need to use our voice and our power to change, uh, radically change. It's not Incremental change has been happening, nudge, nudge, and it's getting us nowhere. We need transformational change in response to these interrelated crises. Uh, I think I better hand over to somebody else. Now. Thank you, thank you. Some of the basically, um, Maya, what do you feel are the, the, the crises that we're facing? There are, there are lots of them, there are myriad of others. Are there any specific ones that you'd like to focus on? Just, just, just one, just one more. And it won't be listed as a crisis. Being online, you know, um, so kids not going outdoors because they're on computers, etc. So not interacting with the natural environment, you know, and, and what ways of us there for finding how to um, encourage them to see what they've seen online and all the way through adulthood and out into it as opposed to just staying online. I suppose there are two sides to that, isn't there? There's the fact that they're not they're not engaging directly themselves, but also they're consuming when they're inside, they're consuming energy uh, as well, and they could just be outside ex experiencing stuff for, for free. Um, Johnny, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think all the crises that we're facing are you know can stem from the fact of an economic system that is fundamentally based on exploiting the natural environment, um, and the negative externalities associated with that aren't factored into mainstream ec mainstream ec economic thinking. Um, so whether that be the water pollution, whether that be emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, whether that be nature depletion. And just to put the biodiversity and climate crisis into context, in Northern Ireland we're ranked 12th worst in the world in terms of the amount of biodiversity we have left. 97% of our wild farm meadows are gone. 80, we've had up to 80% declines in many of our farmland birds, curry for example. Um, so you know the biodiversity crisis is here. Um, none of our water bodies are in good ecological condition. You know, so we really are in a biodiversity crisis. At the same time, uh, we have a climate crisis. There are two sides of the same coin. We can't solve one without solving the other. Northern Ireland, we are climate laggards. It's a fact. In the context of the UK, the rest of um, emissions on average have reduced by about 50% across the UK on average, and in Northern Ireland it's 19%. We now have the Climate Change Act. This whole people want to drive action and implementation around that. But I suppose bringing it all together for me, 
being active in the outdoors, being active in nature rich green spaces, not just green spaces, is the key vehicle for which we can inspire people to take action, to hold our policy makers to account around the environment, something that they're typically not held to account for in Northern Ireland because it's typically green and orange. We must get real issues like the environment, like climate, on the political agenda and force them to take action. I was going to ask you what, why why you think we're so rubbish. You've kind of answered that it's because there's maybe not enough direction. From Historically, the it's always been other political priorities, more pressing issues to deal with, whether it's a conflict or how we're emerging from conflict. And um, but you know the environment out there is a shared resource, a shared asset that we all, no matter what background you come from, we all have an interest and a stake in it, and it's fundamentally important for our well-being and, and our health. And we need more action, and we need more implementation. A lot of policy development going on, like a lot of policy development in government. We need to move from the policy development into delivery on the ground. Can I just come from there? Yeah, yeah I was just going to ask Johnny actually. Um, so, do you think there's an awareness of the externalities that you were talking about uh, amongst people in general? So, the understanding that you know their actions have these externalities on the environment? I don't, uh, I don't think so. I mean, um, I suppose it, there might be some awareness within certain groups in society, but by and large, I think a lot of our lifestyles have become sort of divorced from the national environment and where we came from. Um, and we, we need to make that, we need to reconnect people. Um, and I suppose, yeah, off the back of COVID, we hope that there will be a sort of a newfound appreciation of the national environment. We might see a bit of a rebound in that context, but I'm not sure we've captured that opportunity. It does seem to me that disconnection is really key here. So, and then you were talking about it more, even with the young people. We're getting more and more, we seem to be getting further and further away from an appreciation of how the environment is important to us and how we are part of the environment. So I just want to emphasize that. Really. There's also the shifting sort of baseline concept, you know, where young people grow up today and they don't know what, what it's like to hear a curly or, um, you know, to see a hen hire a swoop over a bog. And, you know, when that becomes the norm that we live in a nature depleted society, then people don't know what they're missing. You know, so we need to turn back the clock to show people actually what, what the nature of rich society looks like. Maya, from, from a policy perspective, have there been lessons um, from the last few years? And again, we have to reference everything to the context in the prism of, of, of COVID. Have, has there been a policy change since then that there's, since there's been a greater awareness of, of why the healthy environment is important, not just for the planet, but also um, for humans? I'm not sure that there's been policy, well there has been policy change but it's not implemented yet because we've no, you know, we've no government. Um, so the development of the environment strategy, you know, it, it, it very much recognises the needs and the developments that are needed and for outdoor recreation um, and for nature recovery networks. Um, the, the development of the biodiversity strategy at the moment, peatland strategy. Um, but again, you know, the development of our proposed programme for government target for, for increasing the number of people, you know, that are with, with less than half a kilometre, you know, from, from um, publicly green space. But, but all of those things will require government to be in place for those to come in, you know, to, to actually happen. Um, we are working across government on a variety of those and, you know, Outdoor Recreation NI has been working on a lot of the sort of baseline information that will allow that to be, um, um, for us to look across the whole of North Island and see how well we're doing so through the, you know, the people in Outdoors Monitor that Carolyn was talking about earlier, um, and the green blue space mapping, um, so that we'll actually be able to see what is where and how much is being done, and that that will help to drive the policy where hopefully, you know, councils, other bodies will all, you know, everyone in this room will be able to use that information and say, this is where our biggest gaps are and these are where our greatest needs are um, so a lot of that is happening quietly and you know progressively in the background but it's not very visible at the moment um, likewise part you know department for infrastructure there, there is the budget there for greenways but it's some some of that is the not in my backyard which 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 you know will will be a real struggle in Northern Ireland to to, to overcome. Um, that's a few of them. 
<coughs> Helen, if you cast your mind back three years ago, we were kind of on the cusp of, of COVID, uh, or certainly of the lockdown aspects of it. The weather changed midway through March, and it was fantastic in, in Ireland for a few months. Uh, and people began to think, you know, maybe, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of it was said tongue in cheek. Wow, look at how, look at how the nature has responded to us not flying, not driving. Do you feel that, that there was a, a greater awareness of our own impact on the environment, given that more people were forced to spend time in it and think about it, and that we we give the environment a rest? Do you think that that happened? And, and if it did happen, is it still there, or have we forgotten it all again? Um, it did happen, uh, and certainly for those of us who are lucky enough to live somewhere that we had access to green space or blue space, and I think people appreciated it more than ever um, because their lives were slowed down and stilled and it made it easier for them to connect with nature. <coughs> I think it's, we can get a lot of hope from that, and I do love uh, the David Attenborough quote that People will not protect what they do not care about. They won't care about what they haven't experienced. So that motivates me a lot in encouraging hill walkers and climbers to connect with the environments that provide the basis or the space uh, for the activities uh, we pursue. And I think one of the really interesting, outdoor recreation and I did some research quite early on in COVID uh, that showed how people had taken up outdoor activities and how, even in that, that was in 2020, um, that more than 50% of people said that they were going to maintain those activities. And while they don't necessarily correlate, um, the Central Statistics Office in the South did a piece of research in April and May of last year. Um, it's not population based, it, it was an online survey that had over 9,000 responses. Um, it was called Our Lives Outdoors, so people who had some connection with the outdoors were more likely to respond to it. But over 85% of the 9,300 said that they, one of the reasons that they were outdoors is to connect with nature, to spend, sorry, to spend time in nature. <coughs> That's really heartening. And of that 85% who said that they wanted to be there to spend time in nature, 93% of them said that they wanted to learn more about the environment. Like, that's fantastic. That is an open door waiting to be pushed. Um, and we all, you know, we all know if you can connect people into the places where they're recreating, um, you do stimulate their curiosity, they want to know and understand more, and they start to see the interconnectedness. Like, I'm on a mission to help hill walkers recognise that the hills we're tramping across, ecologically, are actually in quite poor condition. I didn't know that for years either. Now I'm starting to recognise the absence of keystone species for heathland habitats. Yeah, they're designated, but actually, our designated habitats are um, almost invariably in bad condition and it's there's a bigger picture to it yes there's an impact from where we put our feet but there are other things impacting on the condition of our environment as well and connecting people into nature is the, the key to then being a voice for nature and to make personal choices to protect nature picking up from that how do we put a value on that um, Alison what, what is natural capital which is in the title of the body you find. Yeah, so natural capital are, are environmental assets, so it's the different habitats we have, the moorland, the grassland, the hills, the, um, the air and the soil, they're all our assets. Um, and natural capital accounting, if you like, or mapping or assessment, is about understanding the benefits that flow from those assets. So, for instance, the recreational benefits, cultural benefits, physical and mental health benefits, but also the ability of the system to regulate water flow and alleviate flooding, to increase water quality, to sequester carbon, which is important in climate change, um, and to provide, you know, agriculture, to provide food and timber and water. So, it, natural capital is about understanding the whole set of benefits that a landscape or a site are providing people with. And they're important for us, 
for our survival, obviously. Um, and we can put a value on pretty much, not all of them, but many of those benefits. Um, and so, for instance, if we have a woodland, we can work out how much carbon it sequesters, and we can say what value that carbon has per tonne. Um, and we can do that for many different services, but some of them are particularly hard to quantify. And we've touched on that a bit already this morning. Recreation, health and wellbeing benefits can be very difficult to value. They're difficult to pinpoint and measure, so they're difficult to put a price on as well. Um, but it can be done, and I think it's really important that we do this. So Johnny was talking about externalities. And, um, so many of the things that we do in the way that we manage the environment cause externalities, which could be water pollution, <coughs> or it could just be um, gradual decline of biodiversity, or any of those things. Or, for instance, agriculture can cause um, more flooding locally, things like that. So natural capital assessment is about trying to yeah, identify first. There are externalities, um, and then to start to account for those when we're making decisions about anything that we do, any activities that we do in the future. And it helps, um, for instance, when you're thinking about new developments or any big um, initiatives or plans, to be able to put a price on the benefits that the assets, natural capital assets, are delivering. So, for instance, I don't know if there's uh, a particular industry uh, that's going to, or there's going to be a development in a particular <coughs> place and it's particularly sensitive and it's a place that people visit and gain recreational benefit from, we can try and capture those benefits and put a price on them and say, look, these are valuable. We can say that without putting a pound sign on it, but it doesn't always get listened to and it's not always put into the cost benefit analysis. So what we need to do is say, look, these have a value, these are the pound signs, let's have a discussion about the fact that we might lose some of these and what are we going to do to make sure that we either don't lose them or whether we offset them somewhere else or whether we can have some kind of compromise in these designs to make sure that people are still getting the benefits that, that they deserve. Surely that's what's, what's needed to influence uh, and, and set policy agenda by those sort of numbers are much easier for, for people to understand and appreciate and let's face it, it's much easier for a politician to look at and, 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 and spout. Yeah, and, and sometimes, sometimes we'll have to use the ones that um, are, are the big numbers and the big hitters and so, sometimes, you know, we, we, don't, we don't base our development of local recreation on um, on tourism, but some of those, you know, will be the ones that councils at least will be able to um, bring to, to their members and say this is worth doing. It might be creating in some ways another honeypot site, but, but it will be another place to um, enable that, that sort of um, recognition that, that money, money can and will come. But um, natural sort of capital, it, it, it's still a real struggle. It's supposed to now be going into business cases, you know, for government, etc. But but the knowledge of how to do that and what numbers to use are still are still really struggling there. Yeah. And, and that that's that's for health, that's for you know for, for the health and the environment. Actually the health of habitats and putting those numbers in, it's it, it's both. Presumably that's for you guys come in, Johnny, because that's partly what you're doing regularly, day and daily, isn't it? Keeping tabs on, on, on number of species and from a conservation perspective, you, you also need those figures to, to influence people. Yeah, absolutely. Influencing advocacy is a sort of a big part of my role in the RSPB and I suppose natural capital, I'd be a big proponent of it. I really support the idea of natural capital accounting and trying to use it to inform decision making. There are a body of conservationists out there who would say, well, that's actually reinforcing the power of the economy over nature and actually we need more fundamental economic change and um, otherwise we're just going to keep going with the system that we have that is resulting in the depletion of nature so it's sort of the, the George Monwell versus Tony Juniper sort of argument and um, I don't see us having any fundamental economic change anytime soon so we're working within the parameters of what we have and in my view natural capital is a very powerful tool for speaking to pol policy makers and decision makers and politicians and speaking their language in terms of pounds and pence. Um, we've undertaken a number of natural capital assessments. Uh, I remember in the early days I did one for Bog Meadows and Minoburn, um, showing the return on investment uh, in those, on those sites. 
up in the Garam Plateau, we recently undertook a, an assessment with Natural Capital Solutions showing that for every pound we invested in peatland restoration, it delivered four pounds in public benefits in terms of improving the turbidity of the water went into the NI water catchment in terms of preventing flooding downstream in terms of uh, capturing carbon. Now in terms of natural capital, um, the one you know, bit of caution I would urge is you know, how <coughs> do we put a value on the call of the curly? You know, so it can't always be ecosystem services at all costs. We can't look at a landscape and say we just need to go max, max out carbon here, max out uh, water quality improvement. Sometimes there's species considerations that means there has to be a trade-off. So I take one for example, one example, uh, Munchies Moss, uh, which is a bog where we work at, um, and instead of rewetting that bog, there was a specific biodiversity consideration there for the marsh artillery. So it meant that we couldn't re-wet that bog, which meant we didn't maximise the carbon benefit, but we are maximising the habitat for the marsh fertility. So there are instances where there are trade-offs where we can't maximise the ecosystem services because we have specific species considerations. How difficult is it to balance the, um, the human need and the conservation need? Everybody here is involved in some shape or form of outdoor recreation. We're all about trying to encourage more people to get to the outdoors, but obviously there is potentially a cost to that, and we sort of touched it in the last session as well. Mike and Mark were making the point that it doesn't have to be one or the other. So, where do you stand in a lot of those um, arguments and debates? Is it, is, it, is it right for the environment? Is it right as a conservationist that we're encouraging more people into wild space? Absolutely, in the right place and well directed, well guided. Um, absolutely, we need people out engaged in the outdoors. That's how they get inspired around nature and the natural environment and actually take ownership of wanting to protect it. Um, there are places obviously where there's very sensitive environmental or conservation considerations where you know numbers of recreationists or tourists need to be limited. Um, you know, we have some species that are on the brink of disappearing from our landscape and disturbance of those species will result in their extinction. Uh, so think of Curlew and some of the successes we're having in the hills, but there's very specific conservation measures that need to happen there. And I'm very aware that the access arrangements in Northern Ireland are very, very limited and they need to be improved. Uh, but in certain instances, limited access onto farmland has actually uh, been good for conservation. Uh, I know that might be slightly controversial, but things like curlew, uh, breeding waiter protection, uh, say in the Antrim Hills for example, the fact that people can't go trampling around with sort of unlimited um, access has actually helped us with the conservation efforts there. But by and large, we're supportive of access in the right place, well directed, well guided. Helen, I suppose it goes back to your David Attenborough point. People aren't going to care about it if they can't be in it or, or, or can't see it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think fostering that connection with place is really important, but also fostering an understanding that we share that place and you know, we share it with other people, uh, some of whom have an owning or economic interest in the place, but we also share the place with nature, uh, with flora and fauna. Uh, so if a bird is flushed, you know, six times in a day by six different groups of walkers, it's not going to have the energy to forage for the food it needs to, to feed its chicks. So um, I think one of the, the things that would be a useful, really useful tool in uh, recreation management, uh, and it's come up a little bit in the work that uh, Chris York and Vincent McAlinden have done on the Upland Path Condition Survey here in the Warrens, is the idea of sensitivity mapping can we have maps that show us, um, you know, with GIS this shouldn't be impossible, but to my surprise, and Carolyn was involved in the Glendalough Master Plan, it was one of the things we had talked about for Glendalough and Ripple Mountains National Park, sensitivity mapping, so we know which areas are most sensitive and should be avoided. But the corollary of that is we'll also be able to identify the places that are capable of um, carrying bigger numbers and try and focus the promotion uh, towards, well, not even promotion, they don't need that, try and focus people <laughs> towards those places that are more robust. Are there other strategies like that in place already uh, across the water, Alison? Uh, not really. Uh, so, you'll get, you'll get into that point, I think, <coughs> saying about the, the mapping. So, um, we do, do quite a lot of projects, some in England, some in Scotland, where we're looking, and we work with local authorities as well to use mapping of natural capital to 
start to allow them to have evidence to make decisions about how they want to manage that land, be it for recreation, be it for building houses, be it for creating new green or blue spaces. Um, so, you know, the mapping is really key there. It, 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 what it's doing is, is, if you've got all of your natural capital assets and your habitats, if you like, you can map those and then map what different benefits are being provided along with biodiversity and, and the sense, 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 sensitive places, very biodiverse places. And then you can start to see if you have information on recreation, where people are going and the routes they're using, you can map that on top. So you can start to understand where people are going and why, maybe using surveys as well. And then start to build a strategy around, well, which are the parts of this place that we need a particularly good, say, for carbon sequestration because it's a sensitive bog area and we want to try and restore that for carbon sequestration? And where are the, where are the areas, or do any of those areas sort of link up with biodiversity areas? So can we kill two birds with one stone? That's probably not the right phrase, is it? <laughs> protected biodiversity. <laughs> but can we, can we try and do both of those things at the same time in certain areas? And are there areas where recreation is fine, it's not going to disturb any biodiversity, or where there are particular views that people want to see? So it's just sort of getting an understanding sort of a sort of a bird's eye view, if you like, of what's actually going on, making it transparent, and being able to make really informed decisions about what's good where. Because we can't have everything everywhere. And we, we, you know, like um, Helen was saying, we can't have everyone everywhere either. So let's try and you know do it in a more directed way and have some strategies for it. Would you be supportive of that, Maya? That the, the sensitivity mapping seems to me to be a good idea, and that could inform um, public policy, and then watch it, which areas are, are allowed to have trails, for example. Yeah, I think in, in Northern Ireland, I mean as well as across the UK, you know, um, Nature Positive 2030, you know, and the government through agreement that you know there should be sort of 30 percent of, of of sort of the country is you know, sort of more rich in biodiversity. As we start to map those nature recovery networks, as they're called, and overlay those with our green space, blue space map and look at where the additional routes are and ways to get into accessible green space are and where those greatest needs are, to, to overlay those two things, I think, will, will be our opportunity to do that in a, in a, I guess, a fairly systematic way. What sort of existing and emerging good practice models are there out there already, Johnny, that um, are promoting a reasonable or sustainable interaction between people and the environment? What is happening at the moment that you feel is hopefully getting the balance right between encouraging use but not, not to the detriment of the environment? I mean, I'm not sure about best practice models. Um, yeah, I suppose for me it's all about the education and the awareness side of things and that's the most important thing so that when people are in the outdoors <laughs> are they actually spending time sort of understanding what's around them and engaging with nature and um, quite a lot of our maybe our outdoor experiences are, I think as was mentioned earlier, maybe sheep wrecked hills or uh, green deserts uh, out in our countryside and um, so we've maybe lost sight of what does it mean to actually be in a nature rich um, outdoor experience, and I think it's that real engagement and connection with that, um, those nature rich experiences that's really, really valuable. But in terms of sort of any sort of models and things like that, it's probably not my probably not best place to comment on that. Or I don't have any um, anything really innovative or creative to hand on that front. Is it um, is it is it an educational thing then that's that's important, <coughs> Helen? Because and I suppose there's a sensitivity here as well, because particularly in this country, as we were saying earlier, we've got such limited access to the countryside, we're dependent on the goodwill of farmers and often it's the practice, the farming practices that create, as Peter said, the, the green desert. So we have to be very careful not to be offending the people whose land we, we want to use, but equally everybody needs to be educated. How do you do that education on those sites and, and, and in that place? Well, um, I think education is vital, but I heard a statistic earlier this week on a recreation disturbance conference that um, knowledge only influences 20% of behaviour um, and yeah, think about it, we know we should eat healthily but <laughs> we don't always. Um, so I think what's happening in terms of good practice model, it's hard to do better than the engagement ranger program here in the Lawrence 
that interpersonal engagement, the opportunity to have a conversation, to tailor the message to that per person's particular needs. I think that's really powerful. And I think one of the other things that, um, you know, a little bit of, I suppose, wishful thinking. At the moment, a lot of the recreation is happening in the more sensitive environments in our less developed, relatively wild places and most of our landscape is given over to agriculture and most of that is the green desert that's been mentioned already. It's a massive jump and having been involved in the National Outdoor Recreation Strategy in the South recently, there is no going, there's not going to be a silver bullet solution to access. But farm payment schemes seem to afford an opportunity uh, because they are levers that influence how farmers manage their land. I would love to see opportunities for recreation incorporated into farm payment schemes that were encouraging landowners to facilitate routes through their lands. Because if we want people to be more active without having to get into their cars to drive here to the moorings or down to the Wicklow Mountains, they need to be able to be uh, the community trails are a perfect exa example. People need to be able to be active from their doorstep. So that is going to create a demand for access in the farmed land, farmed landscape. Um, and then we need to make that landscape a little bit more biodiverse, rich, or more pleasing or enjoyable. There are, you know, the routes by rivers and streams, people love that. Uh, and I did hear Jim McAdam speaking last week about silviculture, about farming, uh, a different model of farming, with sheep on the land, but trees as well. And the trees benefited the land, um, they improved the porosity of the soil, sheep could stay out longer, there's more space for biodiversity. That would also be a more pleasing place to walk in than the, the green desert with the wire fence. Um, so yeah, I think we have to find that balance between nature and uh, the demands for people. Job opportunity for you, Alison. Trying to yeah. convince the, the farmers of the uh, to, to, to use natural capital and and, and then we sort of build that into the, the payments that they get for it. There is there there's a lot of going through at the moment. There are existing policies that are involved in responsible use of of, uh, of landscape. There, there there are payments for that, aren't there? Yeah, so um, in England uh, there's a new scheme, agriculture policy called the Envi Environmental Land Management Scheme. Um, so this is the post Brexit vision for farming. Um, and the payments, uh, the types of interventions um, that would be paid under that scheme came out about a couple of weeks ago. And actually, recreation was in there. So um, there will be subsidies, incentive payments for um, better maintaining paths, but creating new paths for recreation on farmland, but also the educational side as well in terms of access to of schools, etc., to, to um, see what goes on there. Um, so I thought that was really quite good. Um, one of, well, I think the scheme in general, just so everyone knows, is uh, quite forward thinking because it's about giving subsidies to farmers for farming for benefits, farming for public benefits. They'll give money to restore different habitats like heathlands and certain grass and meadows. And they'll also give money for um, carbon sequestration, reducing flood. <coughs> so the kind of interventions that make sense to to, to actually uh, improve those public benefits. So yeah, access is in there and it's really important. I mean, a, another scheme that's quite good, I think thinking about accessibility to green or blue spaces is in the recent environment improvement plan in England, um, there is uh, something that's, you know, it's not been enacted yet, but this is, is, is a, an aspiration that everybody should live only 15 minutes away from a green space or blue space. So that's written in there, so hopefully there'll be some follow through on that. And I know in Scotland they're doing something similar and it's 20 minutes. Um, so I think for urban environments and rural environments that could be really, really key for the people to get out of there. Hopefully we can enact something similar here. Uh, at some point, any questions from the floor? For our panel? Yes? This is a comment that uh, our girl, our girl officials, uh, not that long ago, took a, took a decision to remove the possibility of implementing recreational access and recreational provision from the next agri environment schemes. 
I was wondering uh, how can we uh, lobby and advocate to change that? Uh, that would be the first comment. It's a big question because, as we were saying earlier, there's hundreds of thousands of kilometres of routes and access in England. You have bridle paths everywhere. You've always had access to the countryside, and it's not, it's not the same thing in Northern Ireland as you're No, certainly not. And so just to go back to Alison's point, I'll touch on your point with. Um, you know, the ELM scheme has obviously been introduced in England and that's based, you know, reforming agriculture policy around the idea of public money for public goods. So we have about £330 million pounds a year that goes to agriculture. I'd very much like to see that money continue to go to agriculture, but fundamentally repurpose what we're doing with it. The majority of that money is a basic area-based payment, which is simply for owning land. There's not that many conditions attached to it, but we have a real opportunity with that subsidy, i.e. public money, been given to encourage a group of people or stakeholders, in this case farmers, to do something in the public interest. So it should be, you know, public money being used to deliver public goods, and one of those public goods could be rec recreational access. And um, some farmers will resist it, absolutely. Some other farmers might be quite open to it. Um, so an opportunity for farmers to maybe enable access to their land, to allow permissive paths, to set up uh, turnstiles and trails, whatever it may be. So there's a real opportunity there. I think, unfortunately, the political direction of travel that has been set. Um, before the minister left office, recreation is not going to be in uh, in the new agriculture policy. Um, but maybe in time, once a new minister comes in, there'll be an opportunity to try and get that shoehorned into the policy. But as we know, with where land ownership and access rights sit in Northern Ireland, it's going to be quite contentious. Got to hear from Daryl on this. Yeah, I mean that 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 is uh, it, it, it's it, it's to win over and how to win over the hearts and minds of landowners, the unions that are representing them and the politicians because th those are, that's the interaction of where those decisions lie and therefore what officials are requested to do. Yes. So, so my, what, what about if we had a pilot, if we had about three farmers in Northern Ireland that actually wanted to enable access to their land and we paid them for it and we showed this can work, this is how it works and showcase it and then other farmers might want to join the scheme. Because quite often we have, you know, people speaking on behalf of farmers, but it's not necessarily all farmers. And there are other farmers out there who are happy to explore farm education <coughs> opportunities moving away from really intensive production. Just a thought. As far as I know, that team is looking for, you know, that are developing, that the, the schemes are looking for pilots. So, you know, if there are bodies willing to do that, then you have to approach that, that team. Any farmers here? Sign up immediately. Another question? <laughs> uh, I was uh, just going to add to that discussion. Obviously, I've had my say plenty already, but just a reflection on that issue. Like what, what Johnny says makes perfect sense. Why not have the option there for farmers who want to do recreation do it and be rewarded? I think the issue is that the prevailing mentality is that once there would be one move towards opening up recreation, it would be the thin end of the wedge. So the concern from a lot of farmers is next thing will be right to roam, then there will be access everywhere, etc. So what, what appears very sensible to most of us and very gradual and reasonable is there's a, there's a real fear and suspicion of. I, I have no idea how we crack that. I think Vince, you have seen that mentality as well, I'm sure. Uh, but I think that's the issue. And, and the, 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 other, the other, I think, concern, um, I believe, of landowners is that um, the money that currently comes to them, they, they would view they still need to be able to continue doing what they're doing, and therefore, if there isn't additional money to do the additional things, then then actually that that would that would mean that they have less for what they wish to continue to do. We all like additional money, thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes, next question. I, I would just add there as well on that um, idea around the pilot. Johnny and others have mentioned it as well. Not to put anybody under any pressure in this room, but there's, there's funding applications live at the moment around a project that might look at something like that that the Dorney are involved in. So what's the space hopefully over the next next couple of months around that one? So yeah, it's a great idea. Got a question here, here. Hi, I'm going to go back in the conversation. Uh, I really like at the beginning it was highlighted for several people that the main problem that we have is our disconnection with nature and this connects a lot with the idea of planetary health and this idea that we need to understand that when we 
damaged the environment, we are damaging ourselves. And one of the main challenges that actually planetary health talks about is the imagination challenge. And I think this has a lot to do with some empathy failures and the, the failure of having this emotional connection with nature. So here it comes my question. How do you think we can do to rebuild this connection with nature? And to narrow down a bit this question, do you think art could play an important role in that? Hello? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, we live in a very visual world um, and much of it influenced by social media. So arts, absolutely, uh, video uh, particularly, um, look at how all of us have a camera in our pockets, how that's changed the imagery that you're seeing every day. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, definitely a scope, uh, scope for the arts. Um, not the most creative person in the world, but I think to encourage that would, would be fantastic. Um, I find it hard to beat actually getting people out in nature. And there was a time when I was, my interest in hill walking was going faster and further, but just like the slow food movement, I think walking is a wonderful medium for connecting people with nature because you're not worried about falling out of the boat or dying. Um, you can actually just relax, slow down, enjoy where you are, and bringing, incorporating sketching into that, uh, or poetry, or something like that, uh, brings another dimension to people's connection with nature. Thank you, Alan. We're out of time, but I have one more question. Hi there, my um, name's Gavin, I'm a Marine Protected Areas Officer for NERA. Um, one of the parts of my role is providing some amount of best practice for outdoor recreation folks. Um, I'm familiar with the marine side of things like adventure-wise and the wise team in general, but I'm not that familiar terrestrially. Is there any kind of best practice things for preventing disturbance to wildlife and sensitive habits that you know of that are already in place? either here or the rest of the UK that you might want to highlight or for the other thing we can learn from? There's probably too many of them um, and they tend to be site specific. Um, many people will be aware of the, excuse me, the Leave No Trace program um, and that does help spread awareness of the impact that recreation has on wildlife. You mentioned WISE, European Network of Outdoor Sports that Mike is involved with has some guidelines as well. And currently, ENOS um, is running a project, or a European project, called C, Sustainability and Environmental Education in Outdoor Sports. And one of the things we have uh, volunteered to um, test the toolkit that's being developed for the C project. But one of the, thing, the things I really like about the C project is it focuses on multipliers, the leaders and instructors in the outdoors who have the potential to influence large numbers of people. I think that's a really good way of um, spreading the love and yeah, uh, let's see how the, the C toolkit works as a, a medium for getting that across in various outdoor pursuits. This final panel session is entitled What is Next for Local Communities uh, on Outdoor Recreation? And of course, we can't do anything in Northern Ireland without the support of the communities, uh, as anywhere. The panellists that we have for you here are Richard Armstrong, who is the Senior Development Officer at Paths for All, which is a Scottish walking charity. Philip Weston is the Head of Place Shaping at Outdoor Recreation in Northern Ireland. Paul Tamati is the Assistant Director of Leisure and Sport at Murray Moore and Down District Council. And Ian McCurley is a Director of the Woodland Trust. Please welcome the panel. We'll start this one guys the same way we started the previous two. We're going to have one uh, common question that should ease you into it. If, is there a, a bucket list outdoor location that you haven't yet explored that you'd really love to return? Uh, I think uh, kind of everything when I've been kind of heading away, from, you know, based in Scotland, I always tend to go north, so I'd kind of pray like to explore the southern part of Scotland a little bit more. Good. Uh, uh, I think for me, Connemara is somewhere I've never been. Been to the West of Ireland many times, but never been to Connemara. So I think just even exploring more of the south of Ireland and more mountain trees. 
and also we're hearing it's a lot less busy than the morns. Might be a plus. Well, does it have to be loud or uh, No, well, obviously you're not from originally from here, so you can, you can pick anywhere. You can use special dispensation, pick anywhere. Yeah, well, I suppose I'm a New Zealand native uh, from uh, the other side of the world. Um, and I suppose something that they've done, I was recently home there in February, and something that they've done back in New Zealand is they've created a, a cycle path trail the length of New Zealand, the government, right? And something Mike was talking about earlier um, was about the importance of the hierarchy, if you like, making decisions like this. And the New Zealand government have gone ahead and done that. Um, and we talked about vesting land for the likes of motorways and all these sorts of things. So, it's a trail, it's not quite complete, but essentially there's an infrastructure where you can cycle from one end of New Zealand, or walk if you want, uh, to the other. Um, I'm from a really, uh, I can't say that word, uh, from a really small <laughs> town in New Zealand. Uh, and um, this, there's a trail now that goes through my town, right? It's called the Ocean to the Alps Trail, right? Because the, uh, these cycle trails are built up in sections or walking trails. Uh, Ocean Dales goes around some of the best scenery. Uh, majority of it's near the roadways and stuff, but you also go, if you like, across to really scenic parts that you'd never have seen before. Um, and I've never done that, right? Even though it goes through my hometown. And uh, that's something I'd love to do, and I think it would be bucket list for most people. It's quite a scenic part, part of the world. Um, but it's, and we talked about, uh, I suppose, those four principles that was mentioned earlier about biodiversity, sustainability, all those sorts of things. So. I was home in February, you couldn't get an Airbnb, a hotel, a motor, anything like that in a small town, right? Packed with cyclists, packed with walkers, packed with adventurers. So it brings the economical benefit, it has the health benefits, and all those things uh, of sustainability that goes with it as well. So that's my life for I wish you worked for North Dover accounts instead of that. Uh, <laughs> 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 could have told them you have a travel, uh, uh, cycle track that runs a whole length. <laughs> New Zealand, but we can't have one between uh, Hollywood and Bangor. Anyway, Ian, <laughs> is there a, a pocket list out for a location that, that you've yet to visit? Oh god, there's so many, but um, I don't know, that was really interesting, because I was in New Zealand in 2006, and loved it, but it really does feel like the other side of the world, <laughs> and it felt a lot like Ireland, um, but it was a cracking place to visit, but uh, I was really lucky, I lived in California for quite a while, and you know, anywhere where the ocean meets woodlands, vice versa, Pacific Coast, I just love because um, you've got nature, you've got the sort of, you know, the, the redwoods coming down to the sea. The Pacific's not a, it's not placey, like it, it's really wild. Um, so I love that wild nature, but if it's going to go somewhere and you're going to pay for it and give me tickets to go, <laughs> consider that I might bring my children with me, I don't know, I might just go for a while. Um, it'll probably Costa Rica. It's the one place I haven't been where I've always wanted to go. Um, and I need to make, make a chance to get out there, but that would be it, just Pacific. Um, and the Caribbean on the other side. Paul has just touched on this, but why is access to good quality and well maintained outdoor spaces important for, for local communities? Obviously, as he's mentioned, it brings huge financial benefits for a start. Why is it important? I think everybody's different, but um, from my own point of view, um, being outdoors just, just balances me. Um, you know, I can go out on a mountain bike. And say I'll be back in an hour and a half, but I'm not back in four hours. I think we're in a lot of time to go, you know. So you're out there, um, sort of working out. So that's a, that's a kind of personal thing. But I think during COVID, you know, we've seen massive growth. We talk about COVID a lot today, and you know, it, we're sort of out of it. But it's changed things to a certain extent. And sites where you wouldn't have seen many people. I'll give you an example. Actually, a lot of woodland between here up towards Crossgar, Glasswater Wood, um, small woodland, probably 20, 25 acres that we own. And previously you would have got 8,000 people in a year walking around it and having a nice time. Post-COVID, 78,000. Yeah. And wow. then we came aboard the council and the partners in Orney and started to develop it to make, make more car parks and walks for people. And we bought some more land. So, so I think everybody needs to get out and about. And they might not identify it as anything other than going for a walk. But I think it's important that we give people to that. And if it's on their doorstep, it makes life a lot easier for everybody and takes some of the transport issues and things. So I think it's, it's headspace and getting out of nature, really. Philip, have you got an opinion on why it's important to local communities that they have access to spaces outdoors and, and, and trails? Yeah, I think it's, it's everything that we've been talking about today and why we're here. We're talking about health environment communities. So you've got your 
uh, your physical health improvements, um, you've got your, your change in behaviour to, to get people active, get people outdoors, um, to instead of you might put in a, a trail or have a nice cold green space that allows you to walk to school as opposed to having to drive to school or cycle to work as opposed to having to drive. Um, it helps with the, the mental health and well-being, get outside, it's you know, showing your head, it's just having that tranquility, that serenity. Um, just so many, so many benefits in relation to the environment with connection. Um, we've been talking loads about this just in the last bit, you know, about um, being out there. And uh, it was the, well, I don't know verbatim, but the, the quote um, from David Alba that Helen mentioned earlier on, you know, that if you don't know about it, you know, you'll not love it or not respect it. That's completely not the quote. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I had a dab bit earlier on in my head. Anyway, but yeah, it's that whole thing, you know, if you don't know it's there, you don't know it and you won't care for it, you won't engage with it. And the work that we've been doing with Woodland Trust um, through in partnership with New and Down, um, you know, getting we've we've developed a trail to, for example down in Ockram Hillwood in Atacol in County Down. Um, brand new woodland on, on a quite an exposed site. And that's a great opportunity for the community to connect with that site, to see it from the very start of growth and to watch it grow, learn about it, get engaged with their um, engage with the Woodland Trust and with the actions that they're doing with conservation data through volunteering or fundraising, you know, becoming members of those. So those are those are definitely some of the opportunities. You've got connectivity with regards to the social aspect. Um, it, getting outdoors, meeting people, maybe joining walking groups, um, and having good high quality green space helps to do that. And the high quality part for me is key. You know, you can have green space that um, you know, we talked a bit about the, the green deserts and you know, you, there's nothing there to invite you to do it. You might not have a trail, it might be well eroded or, you know, and people won't go there, they won't have the confidence to go there or the desire to go there. But if you provide accessible um, or improve the accessibility, accessibility of somewhere, you'll get more people out, you'll get more people getting those benefits um, of the, the connection. Thank you, Philip. Richard, it seems to me that Scotland's a bit ahead of us in, in all of this. Which is odd because the very, very similar climates, very, very similar countries in many ways, similar size, you've a slightly larger population, and um, maybe less population density, I would imagine. But what have you done to increase the amount of walking that uh, is happening in, in, in Scotland? How much of that has been policy and strategy, or, or where does that drive come from? Yeah, I think a lot of the drive comes from kind of recognising that, you know, for a long time, the kind of health statistics in Scotland were really quite challenging and a way of kind of reversing those challenging statistics was to encourage people to be more active <clears throat> and kind of walking as many people will know is one of the easiest ways to encourage people to, to be active you know, it, it doesn't require any specialist equipment to, to go and do it uh, and almost everyone can do it so it's a, a really good way of encouraging people to, to be active so that was kind of recognised at a, a government level and then round about 2014, Scotland launched what we refer to as the Scottish Walking Strategy. So although it's called the, the Scottish Walking Strategy, it is highly relevant to you know, walking and treatment as well. But it was, from what I understand, my, my boss kind of tells me this all the time, because she wrote the strategy. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the first country, country-wide walking strategies that were produced anywhere in the world. Uh, so the, the walking strategy was kind of... Uh, its vision is to kind of develop a Scotland where everyone has the opportunity to go for a walk, whether it's walking for recreation or if it's walking for active travel. And another part of it, the, the vision is to kind of create a Scotland where the walking, where the environment is designed in such a way that it encourages people to go for a walk. A key part of the, the policy to the, the strategy kind of acknowledges that Scot uh, walking is really quite a diverse activity. Uh, there's got lots of different benefits to it, and in a kind of policy perspective, it kind of has got the opportunity to fit into lots of different policies, policy areas. So there's so many that I've often had to write them down here. So I'm going to write them off some of the policy areas that's highlighted in this, the strategy that working fits into. So we've got health and well-being, we've got sustainable transport, road safety, planning and land use, environment, tourism and recreation urban and rural economic development, disability and equality, education and lifelong learning, climate change, housing, sport, community planning, early years and volunteering. So that's kind of 16 policy areas. Since the walking strategy has been developed, um, there's been a key push to embed walking within all these different policies. 
So within Pass for All, for example, we've got a member of staff. Uh, he's, his job title is, is a policy officer. Uh, and his role is that every time there's a, a kind of policy that's up for, um, it's being revised, or a new policy that's being uh, developed, he'll go through it with a fine tooth comb. And every time that he sees a, an opportunity for walking to have a, an input, he'll kind of mention it within the consultation process. And nine times out of ten, every, every time that walking is included, it kind of remains in there. So over, since the strategy was developed, we've been able to embed walking in lots of different policies. In addition to that, last year we kind of Scotland launched a new um, transport strategy. Uh, and within the transport strategy, it gives priority to walking and cycling. So it's, we have the, within the, the strategy, there's a kind of um, transport hierarchy. And it has walking firmly at the top and then it's got cycling below it. And the hope is that by having it in there, in that way, that when people are needing to kind of carry out a journey, they'll go through a little bit of a process and say, OK, can I, can I walk there first? And then, you know, maybe they can't walk there, then they'll say, can we cycle? And then maybe, the, maybe they can't cycle. Then the next option is, can, I, can they use the bus? Can they use public transport? And then at the very, very end, there's the car. So they're trying to kind of reverse this kind of trend that's existed through all parts of the world, I think, for a very long time that car has been king, and we're kind of trying to reverse that. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what we've been trying to do from a, a kind of policy perspective. And I think in terms of, um, you know, kind of, yeah, in some kind of policy areas of this bill, there's been a tendency to kind of focus quite a lot on cycling, and kind of a little bit less so on walking, but we're kind of slowly starting to kind of reverse that a little bit, and kind of walking, it's kind of walking and cycling is being kind of put together. Yeah, so rather than just focusing on one or the other, it kind of includes both. Thank you, Richard. That's incredible that they've got walking and they've reverse engineered it almost, that that is now the priority for, yeah. for infrastructure projects would be amazing if we copy that and have something similar here. Um, Paul, what community trails have you delivered in this area and what impact have you noticed in the local community? What are they telling you? Um, I think we've done about 10 community trails overall in, in the local council area. And that's, when we say community trails, that's outside of the trails that you have in the Coolbaronies and here in Donald, etc. and those sorts of things. So, um, you know, Drunkira, Tevedara, Seaford, uh, Daisy Hill, Crossgar, the one with glass water we are just talking about there as well. Um, there's a number of them, um, and when the council hasn't delivered them on their own, right? They've maybe been a bit of a driving force, but the partnerships, not just with Lights and Woodness Trust, with the Outdoor Recreation Society, but probably more, almost more importantly with the community, uh, and um, engaging with them as part of that process has been, has been key uh, in terms of that participation. But I think for us, we're this particular council. Um, I think it's to acknowledge the leadership, if you like, within the council that have had the vision, if you like, to prioritise something like community trips. Um, there's loads of stuff we do as council for, if you like, health and wellbeing, physical activity. It's part of our corporate plan. It's probably in every council's corporate plan about that. Um, and so it's not hard to, I suppose, make an argument for it uh, in that respect. But we do things like, as you see, we do things like, uh, I suppose, structured sport and, and those sorts of things too. But this council particularly prioritised the likes of community trails. And the benefits of that is, whilst we've delivered a number of trails, in about 10 probably, the delivery period of that's probably mainly been in the last four years, maybe five. Prior to that, we had a um, community trail development plan. And that, the way our council set up, is we set up with uh, district electoral areas, seven district electoral areas. Uh, we have councillors that are uh, part of that. We have uh, we call them DEAs, we then have DEA meetings and we go and uh, discuss the likes of prioritisation of trails and, and those sorts of things as part of that process. So the community is brought in at the start and it's not just councils on those DEA groups, it's community representatives, community associations, all those sorts of things as well. And so um, for us to develop the, the plan to start with and I suppose having the strategic element is important. Um, the other part of that is the funding that goes in behind it. Um, and the funding for not delivering the trail at the start, but almost like the seed funding for the development because there's planning permissions to go in. And anyone who's tried to build a capital project, you know there's significant amount of money that has to go into just coming up with the idea and design work, uh, <coughs> ecological studies, all the things to put it through the planning process. And I suppose the council, if you like, commits to that process. Uh, and then when we get plan things like planning permission, that we 
also then support it by working with uh, the likes of DERA, the likes of Tripsy, and all those sorts of funding elements that allow us to draw that money down and deliver those projects. So for me, it's, it's not just the council, it's, it's a wide range uh, of partners and stakeholders that are involved in the process, but at the core of it, if you like, is the community development of it, which in that respect, if, if that's where it starts, if you like, in terms of the design phase, and I know we talked about it earlier about getting involved early with the community at the start, certainly around things like inclusive, what Kevin was talking about and stuff, um, you know, that's key, and that's where I suppose you ensure that the success, if you like, so. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, you can see, oh, it's obvious why a council would want to promote uh, access to, to the outdoors and, and trails through woodlands and everything. There's massive benefits for the community, it keeps everybody happier, it keeps everybody healthier. Why would the Woodland Trust want to promote it? Because you're ultimately about conserving woodland and increasing the areas of woodland, so why would you want people walking through it? It's part of our core purpose. Um, you know, we want to look after woods. Um, somebody earlier on said, we're at least with a country in Europe, and we are. Um, so we want to see new woodlands get planted, and Auckland Hill is a really nice example of that. Where a landowner wanted to plant up land, put it in the trees, but the barrier was that he had to pay for it, and they claim it back from the government. So we came in and said, actually, we'll lease that land off you and plant the trees. And then the council and Orny came and said, well, why don't we do a trails network there? So what started just as woodland creation, then turned into a site that's attracted 30,000 people. So. There's kind of like a, a natural progression, but for us, you know, the Woodland Trust in Ireland was born at a program called The Woods on Your Doorstep, and that was about getting woods to people's doorsteps. Um, a lot of the sites were really embedded in communities, and we got about 50 sites across Northern Ireland, so some small ones inside of this room that people walk their dogs through, um, some medium ones inside, some big ones like Moore Park and the work in the Fawn Valley. So for us, if you don't bring people to the sites and get them to appreciate it, you, you don't get the buy-in. Um, and people don't value it. So we find with, with the likes of Moore Park that we only bought there a couple of years ago, it's bringing in about 100, this, in the 12 month period since we got it, we think it's going to bring in 100,000 people. You know, the first week was like 1,500 people. It's, it's super busy, so we need to balance out that flow of visitors, how people are using the site and enjoying it. But actually, there hasn't been a really negative response to litter on the site. It's a really precious site, there's lots of ancient wooden there. People are generally walking on the trails that are there, and somebody else was talking about that earlier. It's, it's putting the trails in so as people can access the site. But uh, we just want people to come in, enjoy our sites free of charge, appreciate it, maybe volunteer, and keep coming back. So, so we've got three core objectives, you know, so it's planting trees, looking after old woods, and get people involved. Those sort of numbers that uh, Ian's talking about, Philip, must cause you a few sh sleepless nights <coughs> whenever you're trying to shape places and, and open up access and promote access. You know, they're, they're, the kind of growth is, is extraordinary. How, how is that being managed? Uh, it doesn't cause us sleepless nights. It makes us excited because it gives us more opportunity um, to, you know, to I suppose have a purpose and to help us deliver on um, on outdoor recreation in Northern Ireland and, and even you know beyond. So, um, and for the remit, I suppose for community trails, you know, it, it gives us more purpose to try and to try and fight for those as best as we can. Um, first of all, to say to Paul, you know, sold yourself short there. With the retired community trails, I think we've developed maybe 15 or 16 um, since about 2014, which is which is brilliant. Um, and you're moving down a really leading the way, in that, which is excellent to see. Um, and you know, you know, long may that continue, which is which is great. But uh, yeah, I I think you know the, the more people that are interested in, in getting outdoors, um, and hopefully that will open up more opportunities um, for development in the future. But it definitely doesn't. Doesn't keep, keep me awake. It's okay. to do that. So <laughs> my own case. It keeps me awake there. Um, <laughs> because uh, whilst development of the community trails is one thing, the maintenance and upkeep uh, are another. And I suppose a lot of the stuff, the more the meat, more people use it, stuff like that, things like the maintenance of trails. Um, and that tends to fall to the council as well. Um, and these are additional assets that are, I suppose, adding to already a huge portfolio. Um, and the significant costs that go with that in terms of the maintenance of trails and that. Um, and certainly over COVID, we, we had a number of community trails that were already developed. Um, the maintenance of those, but things like, uh, you know, bins, if you like, rubbish bins, those are all, all bit as much as we educate people to take stuff with them. Um, the amount of rubbish and all those sort of things that come, that puts pressure on us as our cleansing department within the council, to put additional bins in, dog fouling, all those sorts of things. So, 
Um, so whilst it's great that we've got the community trails, um, it's also about um, having the sustainability to, to maintain them, to, to continue, I suppose, to react to the, if you like, the public and the customs needs as it, as it moves forward. So yeah, I'm the one that's up at night, not him. <laughs> I was just going to add to that. Yeah, just, I think what you're raising there is a really valid point, which is, comes down to resourcing. Um, and obviously, uh, New York Morning Time has a focus, um, you know, on that's your aim is to, to try and deliver your community plan of getting more people outdoors um, through community trails. But I also think that that maybe keeps other councils or other organisations or other landowners maybe awake to an extent because, you know, they would love to do that too, but um, it may not be a priority for whatever reason. But if there was added resourcing out there to, I suppose, resource councils and those organisations that would deliver in community groups, you know, from that early stage through the scoping, the feasibility, through the delivery, and then through what Paul's talking about, the management maintenance, um, and making sure that there is enough money there, because we see the benefits of, um, on, of what community trails have on, uh, on our you know, health and well-being and the environment. So if we can invest in those, then you know, that might save money elsewhere. Um, and it definitely shows the importance you know, on community trails. And, and I would like, like a view on from, from all of you before we throw it up into the floor, if you had a magic wand and that you could wave about how things worked in the future in, in relation to providing off-road trails and the benefits for communities, what would it be? If you could change one thing, what would that be? I think in Scotland that sometimes feel that one of the kind of um, barriers is you know it's kind of difficult for groups to get kind of landowner consent for developing trails and things like that. Uh, and sometimes you know I kind of put myself in a landowner's in situation and I kind of think to myself you know if it was me would I really want these kind of community trails on, on my land that I'm trying to manage. So I think at the moment in Scotland there's very little incentives for landowners. So I think you know I think it would be really great to have a lot more incentives to kind of engage with landowners. And then um, you know, kind of try and try and ensure that there's something in it for them as well. Uh, so yeah, try something to kind of uh, you know, kind of bring the landowners away if you like. Yeah. <laughs> Philip, does that have to be one? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 you can tell us. <laughs> okay, I totally agree with the landownership over here. We've talked a lot about access, incentivising access would be brilliant. Um, helping to, I suppose, remove the stigmas for farmers about liability um, would be awesome if we had an opportunity to mandate councils fully resourced to deliver on community trail planning um, and deliver community trails in Northern Ireland uh, would be excellent. A few more, if I can. <laughs> uh, just even, you know, the planning system um, over here, whenever we come to delivering trails on the ground, you know, that um, the time that it takes to do that, the hoops that you have to jump through, would be brilliant if that could be made more, infic more efficient and one more would be just a nice flexible, the funding that we get over here is phenomenal, you know the, the um, departments are amazingly generous and we're delighted to have that money if we have more flexibility about in your funding and opportunities to, to resource um, throughout the, the life cycle of a project, you know from inception through to management maintenance would be phenomenal and I'll end there, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All of your wish list. Um, I suppose a lot of what's already been mentioned. Um, if I was to, to have a catch all, it would probably be about the bureaucracy and if we could get rid of that. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll uh, I suppose, listen, what we need is, is that policy change. Uh, like when you, when you hear what Rich has got in, uh, in Scotland, uh, where they're prioritising walking before they are cars, etc. And, and that becomes what it was. So, when I say bureaucracy, I mean that leadership and decision making at the top. Um, I do feel here in Northern Ireland we almost have to deal with that uh, additional political layer before we actually get into the, the nitty gritty of, uh, of the right policies and stuff like that. There's, a, but there's obviously a, a clear rationale why that is. Um, but no, for me, if we could get rid of a lot of that uh, sort of red tape uh, a wee bit and just, I suppose, let the organisations that can resource them and just let them get on with it and work with groups like Audi, Woodlands Trust. You know, some really good stuff happening out there, um, but we're also almost swimming against the tide sometimes of trying to get it done. Uh, and so I think if, you know, if we'd be swimming with the current on a lot of things by getting rid of a lot of red tape, we could get a lot of these things delivered more effectively, more efficiently. Thanks, Paul. Ian, have you got a single thing you'd like to change or hope for the future of uh, provision of trails? Just how you connect it all up, you know, so where your access is, where your conservation features are. How you work through it. Uh, I don't want to go on a bit red tape, but you know the.
file system is challenging and the amount of money you've got to spend to get an application in is immense and there's no funding for that. And then you're, you're usually against the funding deadline, you know, so at the end of financial year and the amount of surveys you've got to do to get a set across the line. So the, the, the red tape does cause a lot of issues and problems and I think there's probably a quicker way of doing it, more streamlined way. But I think that's for, for, for bigger decisions. But yeah, having the origin of where you're trying to get to and then making getting there actually more efficient, easier and quicker for the best outcomes for everybody. Thank you very much for my chance. Myself, I live literally 15 minutes away at the in Jamara. I live with a bit of seat crew. Okay, I get to wake up every morning and as I'm making my morning coffee, I can look up on the mountain and I can on a very clear day I can see people walking to the summit, which I don't take for granted. It's very, very lucky to live there. And in a way that mountain has shaped my life and it just being from that area, I've grown up in the outdoors all my life. Uh, I was exposed to them very early on um, with the mum. She was a very keen horse rider. So from like it was they just fucking day after the board fucking shit on the horse. <laughs> and uh, from then I've done that for 20 years and as well my dad was a keen cyclist. So through that I was involved in road, road cycling, mountain biking, cyclocross, race all over Ireland. And on top of that I was part of the Boys Brigade, which also introduced me to the outdoors through the Jim of Edinburgh and just doing various activities through there and whenever you live so close to the morns you're never you're never out of them. I've probably done every bit of outdoor activity you can think of in the morns from kayaking, paddleboarding, rock climbing, uh, abseiling, mountain running, everything you can think of. I've done every covered every single blade of grass in the morns and rock. So you know it's played a huge, huge part in my life and just been looking at the photos there at uh, I'll say I prefer, prefer life in two days and I'll do it two ways of that way because uh, rolling, I've only really been rolling the last six years and it's the last sort of two years I've been rolling professionally. Um, I quit my job two years ago, sold my car, sold everything except the dog. Um, <laughs> sold everything except the dog and um, I just committed my life to try and become the best runner I could be and Thankfully, this year it paid off as Raymond mentioned. Yeah. I was fifth in the World Mountain Running Championship in Thailand there in November, which was Ireland's highest ever result, I think, since 1981. Yeah. And as well, back in July, I was fifth in the European Championships, which was probably a sign of things to come, even though at the time I didn't know it. And then throughout the summer, I was competing all over the world in the Mountain Running World Cup, which took place from June to October. So I was racing, I was racing every other week, and I think for racing, I think this year alone, I was racing in eighteen different countries. And thankfully, um, I was third overall, and I just finished behind two Kenyan runners who absolutely abused me this year. <laughs> every time I see them on the start line, I just knew right that was in for a hard time. And, Thankfully, on a few occasions, I was able to beat them, which I think I'm one of only two European runners across um, every discipline of that has actually beat these East Africans this year. So that's something I'm quite proud of. And uh, for any, uh, anyone who's been to Scotland, that their picture up there was taken in uh, Kinloch Leaven. That was a man over vertical corner, which was back in 2018. Um, like, on top of Scotland, the run has taken me to some absolutely strong places. You've got the uh, France, Switzerland, the Alps across there, in Italy, and as far as Thailand and Argentina. And to be quite honest, the Moors and Northern Ireland, like the outdoor space here in general, I loved it that much. Um, I moved to Italy back in April 2021 to try and chase the dream of becoming a professional owner because Italy is seen as the place to be for my run. And I think in an August time I came over here to race the Sleep Honor Race. I was over for a week just as at home. And I flew home that Sunday. I think the Wednesday I had a flight booked to come back home. I wasn't staying there. <laughs> so that shows how much the morning's mean to me that I was able to I was willing to give up a life in Italy to come back here. And now that I'm based at home in Dramara I couldn't think of anywhere else I'd rather be at the minute, this minute of time, purely because it's just it's home. I couldn't, it's just my home. And 
I just love this so much and been able to go out every day and run the upstate crew to Tullymore Forest, Drum Care Forest, Castle Island with the dog. It's something very, very grateful that I can do. And just whenever you see, when you hear everyone talking about the outdoor space and what the Ireland has to offer, both up, like, just up as far as the north coast and everything, it's such an underestimated um, area. A lot of people don't know. A lot of people just think of the Moors as a beautiful place to go for an Instagram picture, which it's, it's all well and good, but whenever you go up in the Moors and you actually stand and take a look around what there is there to see, you realise what a beautiful place to live in. And it's just, as I say, I think we can all agree that we're very, very lucky to have it on our doorstep, so maybe have to come for their tea. But to be able to say that the Moors is as part of where you live, it's just a huge honour to be able to say that. And having, I've actually brought friends from France and Switzerland over here recently to visit the Moors, and they have the same, echo the same feeling as me, they've fallen in love, and they've actually got plans to come back here in the next Volker show. And that's especially for a lot of people who live at two and a half thousand metres above altitude. When they come over here and see how close to the sea they are, they get lightheaded. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I uh, that picture there was actually in Zermatt, in Switzerland this year. I um, was very lucky to spend five weeks there. Um, I would say that was, a, that was possibly my second favourite place in the world next to the Moor. Zermatt was, I got done, uh, done paragliding or scared the, scared the rents in, but it was, it was great fun. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to thank like, for Recreation Night for inviting me here today. And uh, it's been a pleasure uh, sharing the floor with you. And, Hopefully, you get to talk, talk to some of after. You talk to me now, you don't mind that. you knew from, from really quite early on in your life that, that you were about the outdoors, didn't you? I read this uh, anecdote from your childhood when your brother was given a PlayStation uh, and there was, an, there was an extra um, controller in it, wasn't there? For you, it might have been for you. I wasn't, I think it's still in the rocker this day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I played a PlayStation, no, never, never even done the main even tried, just couldn't be interested. <laughs> I not interested at all. Why is that? Cause I've got kids who adore to be given a PlayStation and a controller to play amongst each other, but it just, it just doesn't do it for you. I think it's because I was just brought up being an outside from such an early age. Um, I think when, I think I had been 10 or 11 at the time when the PlayStation was brought out, and my wee brother would have been five at the time, so it's just whenever I see him open up, I think I was outside walking out the horse and seeing him in the center, so that was what I was doing. But no, they said it's actually just not for me. <laughs> what is it about Italy? Why, why is Italy been able to cement to this reputation as the home of, of mountain running? And, and can we learn from them and maybe take that title at some stage? I mean, if you look at the history of Mount Rome from the first World Championships back in 1885, Italy has dominated both individual and teams from right from junior through to senior, male and female. And it would be something similar to a lot of people over here who go to England to try and make a professional footballer. Italy's the same. And when I did move over, over to Italy, I joined the team over there and they were paying me to run. And we travelled all over Italy, all, mostly Northern Italy. And the opportunities over there to race, like there's races every single week. <laughs> and the passion that they have, not just for mountain running, but for the outdoors in general, is it rubs off on you because when you come back, when I came back here, I just wanted to, there's so much that I wanted to try and implement around my area as well to get people into the outdoors, especially being family. I'm sure they were felt seeing me every day. <laughs> We're going to go for a walk this evening or, or something just to get everyone outdoors because, especially when the weather's good, you don't see too many Italians sitting inside watching the TV. They're all outside. Even, I remember bumping on the trails one day and there's just a, a fellow who's out walking, he has walking poles with him. And he spoke broken English, but he was 92 years old and he was walking, and I must have been five miles from the, the village I was staying in, and he was out in his own. He did a rucksack pack with his, his food and water and whatnot. And whenever I seen that, I thought, well, he wouldn't don't see that too often over here. So he's trying to, it's that they just it's part of their life and you can see it. They all just, they live for it. Obviously, they have a slightly different climate 
Exactly. Uh, then we have, you're a brilliant ambassador for it, Zach, and you speak very passionately about the benefits of, of outdoor recreation. How do we get that message to more people, do you think? I think um, just now, making, making people aware that what we have here in Northern Ireland, it's not going to go away, it's not just something you do once and never go back to. I know loads of people that go for one walk up Steve Crib or whether up Steve Donner and they might never put the hiking boots on ever again. Um, I do personally myself, I'm always, if I hear people who are friends of mine going for hikes, I'm always saying, well when's your next one? I'm always trying to encourage them to go out again, not just go out the once. Especially if they get a bad day and they're saying, oh they didn't like the rain or the wind. And I say, well wait till next, check the weather, wait till next good day. When you, you go back up the morns on a good day, you'll be hooked and you'll want to come back. And it's not just walking, it's the amount of outdoor activity centers we'll have around here as well. It's been able to use them. There's so much to do, paddleboard, kayaking, etc. All that to be done out is, is all part of the lifestyle here. And so, so much more people need to know that it's available to them. And if I can help in any way and help them bring people into the outdoors more often, you know, I, I gladly do it. Do you think it's enough done at, at, at schools, uh, at school level and, and education in general to encourage more uptake of that? Well, from personal experience, living in the market, we were a very rural school, so we did a lot of um, sponsored walks and all up in Drumcare Forest. This, this is going back 20 years ago, so the, the trails and all were built. This is back before all the work got done, and that was maybe once, once or twice a year we done that. And, you had your school sports day now, but I'm not sure what the what the PE uh, procedure is for schools now because I'm not really involved in that. Um, but there probably is a lot more that could be done. Um, I see a lot when I was in Italy, the local primary school, every day they run the run, they done this called Dean Mile. It's mm -hmm. similar to what they have down south. I'm not sure whether they have it here or not. And they were going out every day walking a mile before school started. They all met at eight a.m. and at the end of the day you had the option of going to do another mile the end of the day. And that there, you always seen a lot of uh, children doing that and then in the evening you'd have seen those same children out cycling, running, by walking the dog with their families. It's just, it's, it's, it's put into them from running on. And I think a lot more could be done to encourage children to get outside, play football instead of sitting watching TV and on the PlayStation on their phones. <laughs> You've gone a bit further than the Daily Mile. Obviously, what's your kind of training load like at the moment? Um, well, at the minute, uh, I uh, done a half marathon in, back in January there and leading up to that I was averaging a hundred miles a week. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure of, I run twice a day, Monday to Monday to Saturday, then on Sunday is a long run. Um, but January <laughs> 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 so a long run to be anything from 90 minutes to two hours or three hours, it just depends on where I'm at this stage. But at the minute the mountain world doesn't start from May, so uh, I'm just I'm getting in the miles. And so a lot of it's on the flat at the moment, I don't really hit the mountains until maybe the next month or so. I'll start getting back into the moors. Um, this Sunday I've actually got the Ulster Cross Country Championship, so I'm um, just freshening the legs up for it. Then after that I'll get back into heavy training again. And the 100 mile weeks will start up and my dog will be loving that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, considering you tried a lot of other sports before this, like you haven't been mountain running really for, for all that long, what, how far do you think you can go? What's the ambition? The well, ambition is world champion. Um, it's fifth this year, and that was coming from the last world championship pre COVID was in 2019 in Argentina, where I was 35th. So to go from 35th to 5th was a big jump. And I think it's not going to happen overnight. I'm going to become world champion, but if I can make it happen in the next three or four years, It'll be worth the it'll be worth the wait, and ultimately I just want to see how far I can go in the sport and just be the best runner I can be. And if I can be an ambassador for Northern Ireland and Ireland, you know, hopefully that helps along the way. Exactly. Wish you all the best with it. Thank you very much, and the very best. Of I just say a big thank you to Graham. It makes such a big difference, I think, when you have somebody who's a professional MC in conferences. So and also another just a round of applause to all our panel experts. You know, I think this is the first time that we've ever done a conference where we haven't had 
PowerPoint after PowerPoint after PowerPoint up. And, and you know what? As Kerry said to me, Kerry at the front from our marketing team, she said she took a big risk in doing it. But you know, I think it's paid off. And I want to thank all the panel experts for, for their honesty in many ways. There's some people have said things today that maybe they're going home and thinking, goodness, I could be potentially sacked after that. <laughs> isn't that. Isn't that the way it should be? Yes. I mean, it's been so honest and so open. And I think we've learned so much from so many people. So just a round of applause for all the people. <laughs> and also just thank you guys for all attending. And um, it's just great to see so many people back in one room again and just having an opportunity to share with each other, to network with each other. I mean, it's been lovely for me. I've met people here I've worked with for three years I've never seen apart from through a computer screen. So that's just lovely. And I also want to say a really big thank you just to all of the Orny staff and particularly the staff from our communications and training team. And particular Elizabeth at the back, um, back right, who's put together all the speakers and the Kerry at the front who has been left with trying to get it out and market it all and then the team that's been involved today. So thank you all just to the rest of our staff at Orney for that. Um, it would be very hard for me to sum up what has been said today um, because it really has touched on so many various aspects of outdoor recreation and particularly how we move forward. Um, we have recently been commissioned by SOAR, which is the Strategic Outdoor Recreation Group, which are government departments, to do a review of what Mike had mentioned earlier, the ORAP, the Outdoor Recreation Action Plan that was published in 2014. So we are going to start that review process to see how we could take that action plan and update that um, going forward. And there's definitely lots of things that have been said today which I personally believe need to be looked at and considered right up to ministerial level within Northern Ireland. There's the collaboration between everybody and there's that whole policy side, you know, it frustrates me, but I love it when I hear people from Scotland past from all talking about a walking strategy. We have been pushing for a walking strategy in Northern Ireland for about the past, eating hearts broken, the last five years or more. The problem with Northern Ireland is outdoor recreation is so cross-departmental. It fits into so many government departments, that there is no government department that is prepared to put up its hand and say, I will drive that, I will lead that. The walking strategy, we never even got it off the ground. And when you hear pass for all and what's happening in Scotland, you know, that's a real shame, really, that we wanted a walking strategy, but couldn't get a walking strategy. You know, so there's collaboration, there's partnership, there's things like facilities, the need for more facilities. Listening to Kevin this morning, there's a real need for inclusivity in everything when we think about developing anything in outdoor recreation going forward. There's a real need for education. Uh, Helen, I think, mentioned Leave No Trace. There's a real need for, you know, just, I suppose, an understanding of the environment which we use, environmental integrity. Because at the end of the day, if we ruin the very place that we all want to get out and use and enjoy and that we love, you know, well then there's, we've destroyed it, we've absolutely destroyed our own environment. So there's so many things that have been brought out today. Funding, Paul in particular mentioned something. You know, Northern Ireland right now is a wash with funding for outdoor recreation projects. There's so much money coming in. I've been speaking to some of the countryside officers Literally, they don't know what to do with it. But the problem is there is no grant body at present in Northern Ireland who will pay for maintenance, ongoing maintenance. And now we're getting to a situation actually where we're actually having to, some of the councils are actually having to stop developing things like community trails.
because they don't have the money to maintain them going forward. So again, that brings it right back up to policy ministerial level. So there's lots of things there. And what I would uh, encourage you to do when we get into this process of the review of the ORAP, and there will be workshops and there will be a whole various consultations, that you engage with us because we've heard so many things today that need to be brought up the line through government departments, right up to ministerial, to help us achieve. You know, there's, Zach has got his vision of where he wants to get to in the world of mountain running. I think probably everybody in this room has a vision of where they want to get to in terms of outdoor recreation. So we're all going to have to work collectively together uh, to get us there. So when we start to contact you and lead consultation workshops, please come along and input into those consultation workshops and get your voice heard so that we can get it up the line further and further. So that's my plea to you and that's my party, party political broadcast over. <laughs>